Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and we're going to do our best to sound good today. And this is Jim Cornette's drive through the professional show that you know and love. I'm already screwing up. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. Here he is, Mr. Jim Cornette. Did you just say you know and glove or you know and bluff? Love. Oh, oh, I'm, that's a completely different word. Love. Well, at least you acknowledge your screwing up in the in the open before oh. I had a chance to speak and and make mention of that fact. You're you're Brian. Are you sure that you you don't need a cat a cat scan <laughs> now? I need a I, need, I do need one of those. Yes, a cat 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 cat, cat scan. <laughs> Where can I get one of those? I can't get cat cat scan. God damn it. Thank you for making me the baby do face you, within two minutes. You did. Do you, do you need a cat scan. <laughs> because you can't speak any English. You can't speak English words like I am, like I'm talking now. The good English the, and pronunciation of the words appropriately that are coming out of my mouth. See, you've got me uh, right before we go on the air, but you say I sound like shit. It's pollen season here in Louisville, but oh, you say I sound like shit. I've been on everything for weeks now. Enough and of then, this. And then you say, well, I sound like shit. Uh, or you said, you, talking about referring to yourself, said I sound like shit too, meaning I sounded like shit, and you sound like shit, and we're both going to sound like shit. And then you, you, you got on me, you chastised me, because I, the other day on the on the breaking news clip we did, when I was trying to tell the people a, a cohesive, coherent story from the start of it, and it just so happened that the start of it started with Harley Quinn's bowel movements being backed up, and and you you blistered me about why I was telling that story. I'm afraid to tell a story now because most stories start with somebody's bowels being backed up. And you no, they don't. Con- well, you got to get most some stories kind- do not start with most. That. Most of my days do, so you got to give <laughs> some kind of context, you know, to the stories and, and tell them from the start, Brian. You got to start at the beginning and you got to progress through the middle and on to the end in a chronologically linear fashion, so people understand these things. And if it starts with constipation, it starts with constipation. You left out the meals. I don't know what kind of comprehensive story you're trying to tell there, Tony Khan. You left out a lot of details from beginning to end. What are the meals? Like, do you want me? Do you want to know what she's been eating? Why she got stopped up? Well, actually, I don't want to know about any of this. Well, then why'd you ask me about it? I don't know. Well, do what better are we next doing time. here? What is the point of all this? What is happening? <laughs> this is your program. This I'm is my program. Following you. You're following me. I, like I told you, I'm too scared to come up with anything on my own or tell a story or just engage in any kind of banter with you because you you chastise me. So I'm sitting over here suitably chastened. I am going to not chastise you, but issue a correction on behalf of you and myself here at the top of the show. We got something wrong, or actually specifically you got something wrong recently. Oh boy, here we go. And we have some added details at least. Uh-huh. I'll put it that way. A listener of the show, a friend of mine, the famed ECW referee Jim Molino, texted me the other yep, day. Yep, yep, yep. Is is Jim doing well? Sorry to hear he's a friend of yours, but I hope he's hey, doing well. He's doing well, and my friends all do well. I'm a well doer <laughs> of a friend. I don't know what the fuck. <laughs> I'm a good friend, but here's what Jim texted me. Hi, Brian. Hope all is well. I'm listening to the latest episode of The Experience, and Jim is telling the story of Solo Flex. I'm the one who made all the Solo Flex calls for Paul. Oh, boom goes the dynamite. Thought you might get a kick out of that. Here's the story behind it real quick. I had lost my 9-to-5 job working for the Martin Marietta, and it was Todd, not Paul, who asked me to do it for him. And we did it from his office in Philadelphia. At first, I was calling people who had signed up for the ECW mailing list. After that was done, I started using the area phone books, Southern New Jersey, Philadelphia, all the counties around Philadelphia, and Delaware. Oh, God. How much money were they making off Soloflex? Oh, well, the one time Barron's talked to the, the ad rep guy, I think they got a check one month for like six or eight grand. 
Well, there's uh, some added detail. Is Jim Molino making the phone calls? Oh, that's recently. well, and he did, and he, and he's got the same fucking voice. He never got caught. Hildebrand makes three fucking phone calls, and the third one gets the same operator as the first one. I can't see Hildebrand like changing his voice in any way, or <laughs> I can't envision it in my head. He would have been, oh, he would have been so fucking nervous. He, if, if, can you imagine him trying to do it like an accent? Maybe if he'd have done like a Russian manager accent. Let me tell you something. I live at 421 Springfield Drive. Hello, this is Senor Hildebrand. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, there you well, and there again, an extra layer of validity for people who think that we just make this bullshit up. You know, there's a random story from 30 years ago, and he could be, yeah, I was a guy making the phone calls. There's going to be some article in the local paper down there. The reason why everyone got a solo flex thing in the yeah. mail <laughs> in 1994 was this man. Is, is Soloflex still in business? No, I think uh, they were just in the news. Let me uh, go to Soloflex. There were may maybe the uh, paying people $5 to fucking call you up and have you send out fake fucking brochures that cost you money and videotapes also may have led to their downfall. I was wrong. It's Bowflex that just went bankrupt. Soloflex, oh. according to Wikipedia, as of April 29th, 2023, the website was shut down. An email was sent from the company confirming they have shut down operations. Boom! So no more Bowflex, no more Soloflex. Is this the end of the Flex era? This could be a no more Flex Cavana. Well, I mean, he's on TV every week. Well, but he had to change his name. But he did that in, 19, that, he, he did that in 1996. He didn't do that now. He was ahead of the curve. He didn't change his name. They changed his name, didn't they? Well, then they were ahead of the curve. Anything with flex in the title, you need to get the fuck out. If he had done everything the same way he did it, everything's the same except he's never called The Rock. He's called The Flex. He never loses the name Flex Cavana. No Rocky Maivia. Would it have worked? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Does it pass okay. the name test? It, well, it, yeah, see, there's therein lies the problem, I think, is that Rocky Maivia didn't really pass the name test either in, in hindsight, but there was some logical offshoot of it, The Rock, that, that would and did, that it was an evolution kind of thing. And... You know, a, a stretch on it is Hunter Hearst Helmsley became Triple H. What actually is Triple H? And for the, since they never call him Hunter Hearst Helmsley and haven't for years and years and years and years, newer fans don't know about the Hunter Hearst Helmsley. They do, okay, Triple H, what the fuck is Hubert H. Humphrey? He's the only other one. But the rock from Rocky Maivia, you can, you, it's an evolution. I don't think the flex would have, no. I can't see the flex. Apparently, nobody can see the flex. All Everything related to flex has been shut down. Maybe you should hit the gym, sir, but let's flex away from this. And why don't we, before we get going with all the festivities and all this fun stuff to review and who knows what else, we've done a lot recently. Before we go anywhere, let's talk about Cornet's Collectibles. Oh! Oh! Well, that's a subject near and dear to my heart, and you can... Right now, at this very moment, and, and for all the moments thereafter, up until the feather bottoms are gone, and, and then we might have to cease operations, but you can right now go to jimcornet.com and avail yourself of the finest array of collectibles known to wrestling fandom, including the Midnight Express and Heavenly Bodies tag team action figure sets. The Midnight Express four-pack is still available, but going fast, and as well as all of our Regular fine collectible items such as the t-shirts, the certificates, the 8x10 photos, the books, the DVDs, and so much more. And we're, we're thinking about, Brian, you brought it up. A lot of people responded to it. We're thinking about the Cornet Face funnels to carry in your car because everybody needs a funnel. Except I'm just wondering, what if people start using it for nefarious purposes? Well, how can you use a funnel for a nefarious purpose? I mean, some of these people could turn anything into a crack pipe. Give me... Get, oh, come on now. You That's how it works. It takes a... Oh, it's a funnel. How, how do I seal it off and turn it into something I could cook drugs in? How much crack would you need to fill up a funnel? That's Jake. I don't know about crack. 
Well, if you had enough crack to fill up a funnel, I think you'd probably be able to afford more than a funnel to fucking funnel it into yourself with. Did you see that, you know, Puff Daddy's in a Vince McMahon kind of situation right now? And he's Who now? What? The rapper Puff Daddy, Sean Combs. I thought, that, is he too? Because I heard that they got that Diddy guy. That's him. That's Diddy. Well, you said Daddy. Well, he used to be Puff Daddy, and then he changed now that he's to- Diddy? Well, now he's Diddy, but he was. But who's 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 Puffy? No, he was Puffy too. That was one of his other nicknames. Well, God damn it! What did he work for Vince? Vince copyrighted all his shit. Now who's Sean Combs? That's his real name. That's his birth That's name. That's the real name of Diddy Daddy. Uh, no, not Diddy Daddy. He was Puff Daddy, and then he was also Puffy, and then he was, I think, P Diddy. P Diddy. And then he realized Diddy. that sounded like shit. And he just became Diddy. Diddy. Well, and that's the question everyone's asking. Did he? Did he, did he? do it? Well, I, that's the thing. I saw on the news outside of Diddy Daddy or Daddy Diddy's palatial estate. These are that's heavy machinery. These uh, DOJ and uh, Homeland Security and fucking Department of Goddamn SWAT team up your ass trucks and the people in the battle fatigue gear and the helmets and the rifles and their bringing in wheels of shit out of his fucking house. That's some heavy duty shit. What, what heavy duty on Diddy? What did he do? Well, very similar to Vince McMahon. And we didn't see any footage of when his house was raided. He's being accused of sex trafficking amongst other things. Apparently multiple people who work for him, male and female have come out with stories about being everything from sexually harassed to having Allegedly. Allegedly having women on the payroll that were there just to service him and other people. Uh, there's all sorts of things. Well, this sounds familiar. Yeah, and th there's all sorts of things. Is his family involved? Here. I mean, is it not just Daddy Diddy, but Mama Diddy and all the little itty bitty ditties? Well, we will uh, certainly find out soon. What triggered me bringing this up? What were you talking about I that made me bring know. this up? No, there was a direct correlation. That has been lost to time. <laughs> you said something. We were talking merch. We were talking collectibles. We were talking about we... the collectibles and the merchandise and things that are available. And, and they still are at jimcornette.com. And they still are. Yes. But what the hell did you say that triggered me to think about Puff Daddy getting her? Well, he didn't get arrested. DVDs? No. Fine books? No. My autograph? What, are, what no. in the world? I don't know now. Oh, the funnels, the crack. What, what the else? funnels. Oh, that's what it was. So one of the stories <laughs> in the paper. Hold on. Let me see if I still have this on my computer. I may not because I wanted to read the whole thing. Oh, God damn it. You, you better have it after all of that. All right. Well, and by the way, and here's another thing. The problem is, is that we were trying to figure out how to apply the coronet face to the funnel, because if we make the opening of the funnel, my mouth, which is the biggest part of the funnel and it's the biggest part of me, I don't know how you... My, it looked like I either have a little opening in the top of my head, or it might look like I have an asshole on the back of my head. You have to put the cornet face on the side of it, and then you have some words that say what it is. Well, I'd like I'd like the people to have the option of putting something in my mouth if they want to. I that, don't know that what's may wrong sell with funnels. I don't know what's wrong with you. What color are these funnels going to be? Well, it, it might be all colors of the rainbow. As my, there you go. I can I can contribute part of this money to the various. LGBTQ causes by having it all colors of the rainbow, a funnel where you can stick things right. into my various orifices. You're, you're out of control. Let me go to what I was originally trying to remember that I was originally trying to reference way back when we were talking about crack, which I don't know why you brought that up. There was an article in the New York Post. Diddy's ex-girlfriend, Young Miami, accused... What? That's her name, apparently. Young Miami? Accused of transporting pink cocaine for him. So this is the first I've read about this pink cocaine. I've heard of pink champagne. I've been off the streets for a while, but this is a new one for me, folks. Is it, uh, pink cocaine? Is that like, can we Google that? Is that a thing that can be Googled? Is it a, a designer drug, as they used to say back in the disco era? Or Oh, well, here's a, an article. What? It, what is pink cocaine? That's what I asked you. This is from the Hindustan Times. What? I, I don't know where this is. Uh, right after former Syracuse University basketball player Brandon Paul's name popped up as a drug mule in the ongoing lawsuit against Diddy, the rapper's ex-girlfriend, Young Miami, was also roped into the accusations. On Monday, 
Sean Combs' on-off girlfriend was linked to transporting the illicit drug, commonly known as pink cocaine. Apparently, it's not that commonly known. We've not ever heard of it. I've, I've, I see a lot of the headlines on the major news organizations. I want to believe that every time you snort it, you start hearing Henry Mancini. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway. dun, 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 <laughs> According dun, to the updated Rodney dun, 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 Lil Rod dun, dun. Jones lawsuit, formerly known as Carisha Ramika Bromley. Wait a minute. That's what she changed to young. Ma no wonder she changed her name. The City Girls member reportedly transported the pink-tinted substance for the hip-hop mogul in April 2023. It states that she carried the drug from Miami to the Water Music Festival in Virginia for her ex. But, and this is in quotes, the drug mule, Brendan Paul, forgot it. So now, wh now wait, what? Well, there's a drug mule that was also arrested, allegedly. What is pink cocaine? But no, no, but no, but no, but but wait a minute! How can she have carried it? How can she have carried something that the other guy for? Oh, the other guy forgot to take it there, so she picked it up and took it there for him. Is what they're saying. Yeah, I mean it's hard to find that in Virginia. You probably need someone to bring it up from Miami. If there was anywhere, I would think where is pink cocaine? It's probably Miami. Well, what is pink cocaine? What you might is ask. pink cocaine? You might ask. Also referred to as pink snow, this <laughs> drug is actually not a type of cocaine, despite its name. <laughs> God damn it. The synthetic substance is a drug concoction called Tussie, or Tusi, T-U-S-I, whose roots trace back to Latin America and Europe until its eventual booming popularity in the U.S., according to the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Use. Again, where is this booming? I, I mean, I know I'm a boomer. But you're in, in betwixt and between there, Brian. You're neither none too young nor none too old. Yeah, this article sucks. Is there anything that breaks this down better? Well, I mean, what is... What oh, is now this? I'm stuck on this Hindustan Times website. What the fuck? What is that? <laughs> it's like PW it Insider. I can't get away. What the fuck is this? Has, has the concoction... Uh, what uh, what are people taking this to do? Are they going up? Are they going down? Are they staying level? Are they fucking tripping out? Are they staying in? Are they chilling and Netflixing? What is this? Well, I don't know, but here I have, I have a little more information, and uh, we probably need to move past drug talk soon. <laughs> but pink cocaine is a uh huh. It's a combination of pink food coloring, strawberry flavoring, ketamine, caffeine. An MDMA. Now, so that's the, first, ecstasy. the first couple of things sounded pretty fairly delicious, but then we suddenly we took a, a disturbing turn there about in the middle. Ecstasy and caffeine. A couple of caffeine. those last three could have, can fucking kill you in significant doses, can't they? Uh, ketamine. Uh, caffeine, I don't know about, but ketamine. Well, well you, it could almost kill well, you. Well, me, yeah, that might be the worst thing for me. Take, can I have the uncaffeinated <laughs> pink cocaine, please? Yes. <laughs> I'd, I'd, can I have the diet pink cocaine, please? I, I, yes, the, <laughs> no the, sugar. the diet, the unleaded. I, I, I'd like to be fried for three days on the edge of a bridge, but I certainly don't want heartburn. Wouldn't you just take this recipe if you were a drug dealer and dye it another color and be like, I got green cocaine. Well, and I'm, I'm thinking there's a, it, it could be, it could be like a kryptonite thing. Oh, that's good. Oh, that actually is yeah, a really good idea. Where is some enterprising drug dealer out there with a variety of food colorings <laughs> can, <laughs> can come up with goddamn different kind of fucking shit from under his bathroom sink and some caustic cleaning chemicals and put them together in a color green or red or yellow or the purple. What what all colors of kryptonite did they have? They had the there was white kryptonite at one time I remember. Well, green is the most famous. Of Green's course. the most famous, but gold and red, they had them too. And I'm trying to remember. I'm uh, John Fell can get on this and report in uh, as soon as he finishes getting back up from where he fell in Baltimore. And how many colors of kryptonite did we come up with? But. All right. Well, that was. But none of the none of the kryptonite was made out of cocaine, which apparently this stuff isn't either. So, beware, kids. False advertising. If you're gonna buy something called cocaine, make sure no. there's real cocaine no. in it. Don't buy anything, kids. Specifically, since you cited them, do not buy anything called cocaine. And of course, adults shouldn't anymore either, because it's laced with some dangerous shit. It's not like the good old days. 
Unless you got a good connection for pharmaceutical stuff, but we're not talking about that. Well, there you go. You think Tony Khan knows any good doctor? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on with the show. The great Brian Last and the homophone himself, Jim Cornette. We have a lot of things to talk about. But before we get there, Jim, we're going to talk about Raw. We recorded something yesterday that we're going to plug in the show now, addressing what everyone wanted addressed. <laughs> CM Punk's mention of this show right after he mentioned the Jim Cornette experience on Monday Night Raw. Is that right? We will be dropping that clip in right now. Do you, do yes, you agree yes. with this statement? Oh, I thought, I thought that was your pitch. <laughs> Well, it can be, and it will be now. Let's go now to what we recorded yesterday. Let's go through the magic of time travel. I think I did it there. I don't remember. There will be time of traveling one way or the other. I think we got the time travel in the, in the clip. A quick bit of time travel here. Are you sure it wasn't a long bit of farting? Do you have gas, Mr. Last? It's the machine. It's the uh, time travel <laughs> machine. Phew. Is that the smellow, smellow vision we got along with this? Anyway, I'd try to set this thing up. Well, we'll try to set this thing up. We are traveling uh, one way or the other, I forget, <laughs> to talk to you about something that everyone's talking about without actually doing the full review, which we'll be traveling back in time to go do. But on Monday Night Raw this past week, Jim, a reference was made by one CM Punk to the drive through and the experience, although he ordered it, the experience <laughs> in the drive through but that's, a, that's another story. Well, that's, that's subjective. People can pick which one they want to go first. There's so many to go around. But you have completely confused people that might be listening to this on YouTube at this point, Mr. Last, without having knowledge or cognizance of the fact that this will be dropped into the podcast later on, as you mentioned. But basically... People will not quit worrying us to death, as Aunt Lola used to say, on the Twitter machine about, please say something about this, please say something about this. So we're, we're going to do an episode of your program, one of your a punk mention -y there. The drive through that The drive through That should have been the first show he mentioned. Well, we're going to... We're going to do an episode of that in, in less than 24 hours, but we're going ahead and addressing this Hot button issue, just to get the people off our bow, or at least off of Twitter, to so they can go back to their homes and their lives and their families. They can get out of the streets. I mean, this thing is goddamn. There's people with all bonfires everywhere. Where are you seeing this? Well, it's on the news. What news? Well, WCPQT Poughkeepsie had a big piece on it. But there's a lot of, well, if you if you take Twitter as a reference for anything, and boy, in that case, I've got some oceanfront property in Nevada to sell you. But uh, this has been the big issue here. I'm, I'm Trendy McTrenderson again. People have blown up on both sides of the issue. People who are upset that I have wished death on their favorite wrestlers wish I would die. I just want to let that one sink in for a second. And, of course, the people who listen to the program, of which there are, there are legion, as we demonstrably uh, can it be easily proven, this is not hyperbole emitting from my sense of the magnitude of me. It's just factual, folks. A lot of people listen to this thing, apparently more than we realize, Brian, and we're pretty goddamn on top of this thing. And... Uh, and they're, they're taking the pro and con stance on whether I ought to be elected president of the United States or whether I ought to be burned in effigy in every town square in America with a population over 2,500. There's no in-between on this issue. And, and so we thought we would do a little, just a little statement to put, you know, is, is this like a fireside chat? Do we have to put the nation at ease? Get the people back to work. Now that I think about it, what is this? If we're not reviewing the actual segment, what are we doing? We are we are commenting on being commented upon because it became <laughs> a fucking thing. And I don't know what's the matter with all these people. But again, it, it, here is what happened for, for those of you who may have been living under a rock or a stone or living a life free to pursue your other interests and don't hang on all this stuff. The other night on Raw, 
about 36 hours ago here as we sit here, I guess now or so, uh, Punk was advertised to be on the show as well as, you know, we knew we were going to see Cody and we had a, a whole bunch of big stuff was going to go on. And since I knew Punk was going to be on the show, even I was running around the house is what I was doing because it gets dark later. And I was trying to get all of the evening things done because normally I don't watch Raw live, as you know. I record it so I can zip through much of it later on, right? But I had it on in the TV room so I'd keep an eye on if Punk came out. And I swear to God, I was almost there. And I, I guess I should back up a little bit. Harley's been stopped up past couple of days and then she, she was stopped up for a couple of days over the weekend eating normally but not pooping and then the moment came and it was ugly and required bathing of her in the in the in the sink with the you know liquid soap and the scissors and the whole thing why do you need to tell this story well because it, it ties into what's going to go on here and then she was she didn't poop Again, for another day and a half. So we knew there was an explosion coming. And we wanted to make sure it happened outside the house. So right about the time that Punk was about to come out, she gave me the signal and I took her outside and she wandered around and it took forever. But boy, boy, howdy. Again, it was even worse. And, and what happened was that we had to take her around back to the patio and then do some more trimmage and do some more wiping and comforting of the baby before we could even bring her in the house. And by the way, she's feeling better now. She's gotten all regular and everything. But what happened was I never went back to Raw. So the next morning I get up and I'm trending and people are inflamed and goddamn whatever the fuck's going on. And I had to catch up on this, because, and, and one guy on Twitter got it right. He said, you know, Cornette's trending again, and he's probably out taking Harley out for a Russo and doesn't even know it. That was exactly what was happening. That's how it tied in, Brian. It's a great story. So anyway, what happened was Punk came out, was doing his live in-ring promo that we will cover fully when we record your program tomorrow when we revamp, revamp or review all of the momentous occasion of Raw. But he's doing his promo and he had his mention. He said, everybody, and this is true. Everybody's got to talk about him because think about this. Everybody's talking about us because he talked about us. And since everybody talks about him and everybody talks about what he talks about, well, they, you can see there's a domino effect here. And as he was mentioning his promos and et cetera, that everybody had to talk about him to get attention. And he's looking at Pat McAfee down there at ringside. And he said, you, Pat McAfee. He said, I understand you've got a program, daily program. I don't, not a regular listener. I listen to the experience in the drive through But you had a guest on your program, Pat McAfee, and went right back to it. And that's why, again, he's a master. He's a cunning linguist. Because this is not inside smart talk that confuses the fucking story and half the audience and they don't understand because it's the crux of what they're trying to get together. It was not meant for that audience or for that story or that promo to be an aha gotcha moment. It was a little drop in for those of you who know, you know, and the people who love us, as we said, there are many. They got a pop out of it and the people that hate us and boy, <laughs> there's a bunch of those too. Their heads caught on fire. But he at the same time went right back to the put, but you, Pat, so the delivery was perfect because it was, what do the kids call it? An Easter egg, Brian, where it's dropped in well, there. I mean, not really. An Easter egg, it's not just thrown out there so obviously, I don't think. Well, it, it was there. It, it was a subtle little jab for some people and a nice little wink at other people, and it didn't detract from their story because he went right back to it and started making the points he needed to make. That's how you fucking talk to the smart audience while at the same time not 
deterring yourself from your your program and your your meaning of your story. But nevertheless, and by the way, everybody not only got mad at me for existing and for you and I guess for existing with me, but now, oh my that punk, he listens to those that oh my God. Oh, he's horrible. More on that later. But McAfee emerged unscathed, by the way, but I'll bring it up because when when he told Pat McAfee, Punk did, he said, I listen to the I don't listen to your program. I listen to experience in the drive-thru. McAfee said, understandable. Because I'm sure I'm sure Pat's listened to a program that we've done or two in the past here. Because most people do in this wrestling environment that we find ourselves in. But uh, <laughs> I got to think that Pat McAfee would uh, agree with some of our philosophy on wrestling because, you know, he's from Indianapolis. He actually engaged Rip Rogers to train him uh, before he got in the business. So he had a solid basics and fundamental, which is why he's overperformed for the amount of matches he's had. But, Bri, you are, are well aware if you, about philosophy of wrestling most of the time, if you ask, Rip Rogers and I a question you'll probably get similar answers so I'm sure Pat has it's he's no stranger to some of our opinions one way or the other. Well, who knows? He's a busy guy. Maybe he's just trying to look trendy. Well, I mean he he does, you know, he does hang out with some of the cool cats though. He really does. He's he's you know, he's not just one of these the cool pretend cats. celebrities. He hangs out with the cool cats and and the hip kids. Yes, even him. Yes, he's a rapper, right? Yes, I've, I heard his last fucking record. Really? You heard the record of Heathcliff, the cat? Yes. Yeah. Right. What, oh, is, is he, he's one of the cool cats. That's right. I'll tell you, is, he's, is, it, spelled like, is it spelled like K-A-T-T? Heathcliff the cat? Uh, no, but if he leaves the record label, it may have to be just because of trademark issues. Well, as we're confusingly similar, sometimes we'll get by. But anyway, back to our topic. So after that mention, then they went on with their the rest of the interview presentation, which was brilliant. One of the greatest segments on modern WWE television in a while, but we'll review that at a different time. But that lit Twitter and the, what are the other things called that these people congregate on and are drawn to like moss to a flame to to uh, vent their opinions to the world, the, the the reddits and things and message boards. The mirror. The mirror. You, well, it's the same thing in a lot of cases. And like I said, many were for and some were again. And boy, the ones that are again are again, again, again. And they hate me and they loathe me and they despise me. Big, I've been called a phobe and an ist, but I'll tell you one thing, Brian. One name that some guy called me on Twitter that I refuse to put up with, that I will not ever admit to being, and that I'm highly offended by, he called me a homophone. <laughs> a homophone, Brian, and I'll have you know that I'm not now, nor have I ever been, one of two or more words that are pronounced the same but differ in meaning and sometimes spelling. And I resent that implication. I, sir, am not a homophone. But Ed, what, what is the matter with people? Ed, 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 it tickles me to death. By the way, thank you again to all, all of you people who, as I said, that was a real thing. He wished death on so-and-so's. I wish he'd die. I, I appreciate your venom and your hospita uh, hospitality, your hostility. It does my old retired heart good to see that I can reach out once again, through the the airwaves of life and touch your fucking taint in such a goddamn annoying manner that you'd rather goddamn see me go over the edge of a cliff than a million dollars land in your front yard. I enjoy that. But what the fuck is the matter with how can anybody get this worked up to the point that they were better when Punk, he's not the person I thought he was if he listened to that shit. God, is everybody that listens to Michael Jackson still uh, interested in a improper fashion with underage minors? Maybe that wasn't even a best. That's not a really great analogy. Harrison, that I you putz. What was that? 
Well, I'm offended. What? I'm a, no. <laughs> you homophone. <laughs> but nevertheless, what the fuck? If real problems came up in these people's lives, how would are they the kind of people that you have to call the authorities to go tackle in the middle of the street and fucking restrain and take somewhere involuntarily if they get a fucking speeding ticket? If something really happens in their life? The other thing that makes it all even more ridiculous, as regular listeners know, as anyone who actually knows you as a person knows, I'm a you know, liberal from the Northeast, you're the most liberal fucking person I've ever met. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the other thing. They're saying that you are against all the things that you are absolutely not against. <laughs> yes, it's insane. He's such a goddamn... And meanwhile, they're worshipping the fucking trampoline cowboys that are birth deniers and fucking right-wing conspiracists and fucking, in some cases... Uh, their elders contributed to the fucking tr uh, attempted overthrow of the government. <laughs> Jericho! <laughs> Jericho! <laughs> Who's, did I have any blood relatives at the insurrection? For those of you who are worried that I'm some kind of right-wing lunatic? Did you have oh, any distant relatives there? Um, I, I don't think I have any more distant relatives. <laughs> but anyway, so, but and once again, if a real problem, if a real problem happened in these people's lives, how would they handle it that they are so mad that they have to sit there and type this, oh, my head's on fire because of this guy listening to this podcast and this guy's podcast, and he says horrible things about all my favorite wrestlers. He's horrible. He wished her that he would die. I wish he'd die. I wish he'd die. See, that's the thing. You're all these things that they want to say is the worst thing in the world because you hate their favorite wrestlers or because you critique their favorite wrestlers. I even see some people just come out and say, he makes fun of them. Yes. <laughs> what? You can't make fun of stupid? Come on. And you can't I'm make fun of things you see on these wrestling shows? Come on. They, they make fun of my wrestling business. That's why I make fun of their attempts to be involved with it. it, it, it so we're even. It, at worst, I'm just better at it than they are, right? I mean, is that... Have I sat outside any of these fucking people's houses in the car late at night that I've talked bad about and fucking, you know, goddamn done the old fucking drive-by thing where I'm dr driving around their houses like, I'm going to get you shaking my finger. What the fuck? The old drive-by thing. Is that what you call it? Well, yeah, I mean, the old drive around the house thing, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, you're always saying... Oh, yeah, that the, old oh, well, thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm not talking about an actual drive-by. Well, I'm not up on that lingo. I don't do those things. What the fuck are you doing? I hate Kenny Omega. Blocka, blocka. <laughs> I have not advocated for anyone to fucking catch these people walking down the street and fucking give, even give them a tongue lashing. I give them enough of a tongue lashing. Uncle Dave gives them different kinds of tongue lashings. But uh, I'm just e expressing my opinions and said, oh, he's so horrible, he's so bad. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is we saw a pretty, obviously a pretty large audience come out and comment on this, but. I don't think the Jim Cornette haters was a bigger audience than the people that were just happy that Punk came out publicly as a listener of the show. That's the thing. Other listeners felt, you know, good about the fact that their favorite show, the number one show, the best fucking show, that we are over here and here CM Punk listening. But the reaction from the anti Jim Cornette people is exactly why some other wrestlers who do listen won't publicly acknowledge it. Because of the lunatic fans. Well, yeah, and also, these are the people on the Twitter machine and their the, the ilk that, unfortunately, in my opinion, make the Republicans feel normal. Because they're so batshit, the other, just ridiculously, illogically, maniacally, so fucking hand-wringy and cringy and pearl-clutchy and fucking whatever just from shit that other people tell them that's not even the fucking case. And you, when there's a real problem going, that's why I said a real problem earlier if these people encountered a real problem, Brian. Well, there's a goddamn criminal lunatic trying to be elected president again. 
And so if they're so offended about me being so fucking whatever the fuck I am, ist or is or ismed or phobic or whatever, they ought to really be mad about that because all those people really are. So what are they doing about that? Are they marching in the streets or are they just on Twitter complaining about a guy listening to a wrestling podcast? Yeah, get off Twitter and help rebuild a bridge or something, you idiots. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Don't even get me started on the bridges. Did you see that video of the boat? Yes. I've driven across that bridge in Baltimore when I used to go up in that neck of the woods, now only accessible by rowboat. Um, it, and fuck, that's what I'm telling you about the bridges here in Louisville. Oh, let's just close this son of a bitch down right now in the middle of the day for checking and tests. And it will fuck. And this thing, but the boat fucking runs into one fucking pillar, two miles of it goddamn collapses. How was that fucking put together? And it wasn't like the boat was even trying. He just, they lost power and, and the whole goddamn, what the fuck? See why I don't trust this shit? But anyway, back to this program. The point is, is speaking of building a bridge, Punk has apparently built a bridge with a lot of people that may not have been watching Raw in a while. Did you hear the number? Maybe it's just because he mentioned us, and, and as I said, because of the magnitude of us, but maybe it's because if CM Punk farts in the wind, people smell it across the country. Every time he talks, they want to listen. Every time he says something, it gets a reaction out of people. And I've, I told you right before we started recording this, I'm trying to figure out how to express this, but you, we saw the quarter hours. We've seen that as of yesterday afternoon. As many people joined watching Raw for the CM Punk, Drew McIntyre, uh, Pat McAfee, uh, fucking Seth Rollins at all segment, as many people joined watching Raw as watch Collision and Rampage in totality. And it, and then it, and it went right back down as soon as he was done, by the way. Well, we're not going to do all the ratings here, but real quick, Monday Night Raw, and I have to say, this was an excellent episode, maybe the best episode of Monday Night Raw I've seen in a few years. It was just a great episode. Boy, howdy. This segment was the 9 o'clock hour, quarter 5, Quarter three, it began in quarter four. Quarter three, 8.30, 8.45. The end of, uh, oh no, the entirety of Ricochet versus J.D. McDonough with two ad breaks, which did 1.7 million viewers. The finish of that, the beginning of the CM Punk promo with an ad break in between. Quarter four, 1.86 million viewers. Quarter five, the nine o'clock hour, the Punk Drew McIntyre, Seth Rollins confrontation. 9 to 915, 2.2 million viewers. And then the next segment, Shinsuke Nakamura with a promo and ad break. Candice LeRae versus Ivy Nile. Oh boy. DIY, the awesome truth and New Day's backstage angle. An ad break in the beginning of DIY, DIY, DIY versus New Day, 1.77 million viewers. Boop. <laughs> So from from start to finish, uh, because the, he was only in part of that quarter four, but it still ticked up, and then the full quarter five at the top of the nine o'clock hour went from one point seven something million to two point two million, and then back down again. And it was uh, two point two, by the way, was by far the highest quarter of the entire program, which included The Rock. I have an article here, uh, Dave Meltzer reporting, CM Punk, very close to the people at the top of Nielsen. <laughs> I'm lying, everyone. It's not a real thing. Don't report that on one of your clickbait sites. Don't have it say that Dave Meltzer really reported that. Don't, don't report that he says that until he thinks of it and says it. I, I mean, that... <sighs> you know what I'm happy about? Someone who I have a great deal of respect for in the wrestling industry texted me about it. And I said, you know, because I didn't, you know, what are you supposed to say? I didn't, there's nothing really to say. Oh, it's cool. You know, it is. I said, the one thing that makes me happy, the mention happened 
in the middle of an excellent segment. The mention, yes. it wasn't just a lot of viewers there. There were a lot of viewers there for The Rock, This Is Your Life. <laughs> there were a lot of viewers, and the segment was awesome. So I'm happy about that. And, uh, you know, again, it was a, it was a little, a little drop in there, not a pipe bomb, maybe a stink bomb. Just for the people who know, you know, a little wink Neutron wink. Neutron bomb. Oh, but it didn't take away from the, from the story at hand and which they told remarkably. And, you know, there's interest and you can imagine all these matches that they're opening up that Punk is going to be uh, hot for as soon as he's back with a variety of different people. And he's, they're still keeping a presence and commentary. And we talked about that, that that might be a way to reintroduce him when he's ready or maybe before he's ready, wink, wink, whenever that may be. Because he's talented at that. But the point is, they got at, no wonder Tony Khan is still mad at old Jungle Jack off. Because look at this. He'd still be there, st stuck in that quagmire. Biggest still star doing. They have. Wait, he would still be doing somewhat numbers for Tony, but he wouldn't be doing numbers like this because it's not possible for Tony's company to do numbers like this. He would also be selling a lot of merch for Tony. I mean, there's a lot of things, but I'm sure Tony made a, the best decision he could make. But it worked <sighs> out the best for CM Punk. And, <laughs> you know, you say it sets up a lot of matches, and it does. And I'm sure when those matches are on the big events, I'll really like them. More than anything, again, the trend especially in the Paul Levesque era, and I'm loving it. Because even though there's some boring matches you don't want to watch, even the look, Swami's going, <laughs> even the look has gotten better. Some of the camera shots, the shot when The Rock came out, we'll talk about on the drive through the shots during his confrontation, because Drew was at the commentary table. Everything felt fresh and live and new. Yes. The match They're is getting set up is great, but it's more, more verbal confrontations that aren't just bland. That's what I like, and that's what viewers like, too. And they seemed like they were interacting with each other rather than standing there for three minutes waiting for their line to hop in unnaturally, right? And everybody was a little sharp. And, and uh, well, you mentioned when I'll be Seth and you be punk. I'm Seth. Would you like to hear what I think? Nope. Exactly. Just nope. No one ever says that in a promo. It was yeah. amazing. It, but and and that's the thing also is they are playing with camera angles. It looks more fucking high tech network quality. They're getting a little cinematic presentation in these crowd shots and these beauty shots of the arenas and the the fucking shot they do with a drone or whatever sometimes when they go in the door of the place and see and open up and see all the people and guys like punk who are naturals at communicating and he, he knows how to work television. He knows where the camera is and what, you know, what it's going to look like when he's on TV. So he's not just fucking moping around. But anyway, that's how you draw numbers, folks. Just get on television on raw and mention the experience and the drive through. You're the highest rated quarter hour on the, on the whole show. And if you're CM Punk. That's right. And uh, with that, I think we have covered this issue and so much more <laughs> for almost 30 minutes now. So we'll, <laughs> we'll get back to the drive-thru. We will not time travel back instead. Just so anyone knows, anyone who complains about us, you never ruin our day. I'm over here playing music like it's a silent movie. So let's go back. I, I wish it was a silent movie when you play music. Well, there it is, Jim, through the magic of time and travel. Our conversation about CM Punk's mention of the shows of ours here on, or not here on, there on. No, think, think about this. We just pitched to us commenting on someone else commenting on us and then came back from that to now comment on the rest of the show that was the comment of the person who commented on us was contained in. What do you think of those comments? I, I think they're they're very pithy. Pithy comments. Look it up, kids. That's a word not used enough these days. Pithy. P-I-T-H-Y. And that is what this episode of Raw, I believe, on March 25th was one of the pithiest Raws in 
modern times, there was something to, to, to grab on, to sink your teeth into, to, to hold on to and remember and talk about at the water cooler the next day. Remember when they used to say that water cooler talk? You have to go into an office to do that. No one wants to work in an office anymore. Well, and also, I never wanted, even before the pandemic or anything else, to be just standing around drinking other people's bottled water that they fucking just had their hands all over the fucking spigot and everything. But nevertheless, do you know that the Allstate Arena, Brian, in Chicago, Illinois, which was the site of this extravaganza, that's the old Rosemont Horizon. I'm glad to see the old deer still standing, just with another name. I thought they had just built a whole new building. Have you ever been to the Rosemont Horizon? I never have, but I've always loved the name of it. Because it's in Rosemont, Illinois. Well, it's the horizon part that sounds cool. Yes. Well, you uh, actually, when the sun comes up in Rosemont, there on the horizon, you can see the building. So there you go. And this thing was sold out. 15,810 people is what they announced. And we saw many of them on camera. And the 11th straight television sellout, according to the statistics we have available to us, and they're crowing here on the program. They're fucking, and that ain't going to last until, uh, or as far as, I'm sorry, the record, this was the highest paid attendance for a Raw since some time or other, but that's only going to last for well, a couple more weeks until the Raw after WrestleMania when they can get more people in the building. This this is, is suddenly uh, blossomed quickly on them, didn't it? And you know what? Before this giant crowd, this hot crowd, they had one of the best episodes of Raw in forever. And I can't even remember any of the matches. It wasn't even about the matches. Because <laughs> none of the matches were matches you really wanted to see. But you didn't care. That's how hot the stuff that isn't in yeah. the matches is. You're willing to... Just sit there and watch these other matches. Never yell boo or boring. Nothing. Just watch them. Enjoy them. But when the big stars come out, it makes it all worth it. This was an amazing episode. And then, as Gary Hart would say, this shit going to get started, brother. But anyway, um, and, and by the way, also, <laughs> the central pieces of the show that we're about to praise here were, I mean, there was other people involved, obviously, but Cody Rhodes and CM Punk, again, this is what they're not only doing the best work in the biggest company in the goddamn world, but Tony had them. And, and, and apparently now we've seen he devalued both of them during the time that they were there. We just talked about in the clip if you're listening to this as a podcast or a single entity, we just spoke earlier in that clip about how that Punk increased the quarter, the, the viewership in his quarter hour from before to afterwards, the same amount of people that watch most of Tony's television programs alone. Can you imagine what kind of merchandise they may have made money between the, the number and the rating that they can brag about? And this is the, you know, the the era of bragging about ratings and numbers and all the TV rights fees, and is it worth it and is it not? The, so the, the numbers that Punk is getting them, just coming out and speaking, hurt, not able to work, not able to advertise matches, is worth it for their television. And what do you think they did in Chicago on brand new Punk merchandise these people have never seen or whatever the fuck that they have for this occasion? with 15,000 people in the building. They may have made a profit on Punk for what they they paid him just to show up and talk. How, what is that, $100,000 if you prorate his multi-million dollar contract? They made a profit on him there in the building, probably. Well, you said oh, they're there okay. and they're doing great work. It's not just that. They're moving numbers. Every single metric you can look at. Ratings, interest, merchandise. Everything goes up. And the quarter hour ratings were remarkable this week. Well, and, and when we've been doing our history segments and talking about when we shot an angle and increased the house $10,000 or whatever, 
this is the same principle only multiplied however many exponentially times over in terms of what are your metrics of your business and can you see them rising? Are you selling more tickets? Are you selling more merchandise? Are more people watching the TV? Whatever can be measured is up over here. And the guys in the middle of, of a lot of it were guys that were working for Tony Khan that couldn't coexist under his fucking structure for whatever reason with the people that he surrounded himself with. But nevertheless, I just think I'd, I'd love to know the merchandise numbers because back in the Attitude Era, it, it, on a house show or a TV taping, what I'm not talking about WrestleMania or some, you know, big deal like that. But I would get the reports. And if you did eight or 10 or $12 per head in those days with those prices 25 years ago, they liked that. That was, that was great business. Well, just imagine if they were doing the same price, 10, $10 a head, the price from 25 years ago would be $150,000 doing in merchandise. So what the fuck, right? In one night. Anywho. They did the the SmackDown recap and then brought Cody out to a huge pop at the start of the program. And have you noticed, Brian, the the crowd shots, the the beauty pans of the building? Uh, the, well, we've talked to the new camera angles. They've got obviously with the new. I don't know what his title is. Whoever replaced Kevin Dunn, whatever their title is from and ESPN. New, <clears throat> yes, and and the 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 new television people. I'm sure he's brought in. Whether it, is there a new director in the truck? We don't know. Is there a new camera people, or are they being told to shoot things in a different way? Whatever the fuck, the directors on top of shit. The ways of shooting, the new camera angles, the lighting, the show is looking amazing, and the signs are coming back in the crowd. And usually, it's everybody looking at their fucking phone, right? But now people are actually wanting to get involved. Oh, look at my sign. The better production, and the new production is better than what it's been. For everyone that raves about WWE production, the actual television shows were problematic. A lot of those things that were wrong are gone. And they're yeah. introducing a lot of new elements. You're not getting the fast cuts when action's happening. Like, when I say fast cuts, 10 camera switches in five <laughs> seconds. Yeah. So you don't actually see any action, or or the or the the the, the zoom in and out, the disoriented. Wah, 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 wah. No, I mean every once in a while at a backstage brawl, it might add to things, but it was just being relied on because that's what they were doing for so long. They got a new look. And listen, we're about to talk about this Cody segment. We're about to review it. When the Rock comes out, when you get to that, just that spot alone, that shot, I should say alone, they went to a different camera shot than the. Steady cam, they didn't go close up. You got the whole view of Cody in there with the rock and the screen behind them. It yeah. Incredible. They're killing it on production right now. It's great. And it, it makes it more of an event. Also, look at this shit they're covering. Anyway, nevertheless. It makes it more tolerable in the bad moments on the show or the moments where it's yeah. not really anyone <laughs> hot. At least it's not that tired production anymore. It helps. It, it while they're standing there staring at each other in meaningful fashion, boy, don't those pictures look nice. But uh, but no, I I get your point. Agree with it. And uh, Cody again was did the babyface promo here, and he talked about it. He does this stuff. He talked about agreeing to be the best man at some fan's wedding. He, Brandy said, "Who's Anthony?" He said, "I don't know." Or he went to a kid's birthday party or blah, 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 all the stuff he does. And Roman Reigns likes to say, well, I pretend to be this, or pretend to be. Well, I pretend to be the champion because the champion isn't here. And the people are chanting Cody, Cody. And, of course, you know, again, you can see the dusty cadence. I respect you, Roman Reigns, but I hate your guts. And he got in the line about, you know, Roman. And his cousin can't have the wank fest at WrestleMania like they wanted, and the people popped on that. You know, they're obviously, we've talked about this, they understand the top guys, not just The Rock has a double standard, the top guys get a double standard, and they should, and they're giving them one. 
And also, to be honest, some of these networks, they could afford to piss off. I go, well, I guess they're, they're still going to be on speaking terms and doing business with USA, right? But Fox, maybe they might tell them to go piss up a rope, might they not? You have to wonder if the tone of this show and a lot of the elements on this show is kind of a, a nod to the future on Netflix and what the show is going to be like. Well, and, and Punk mentioned it later on when we get to him. But anyway, but Cody's, it was a babyface promo and it ended up with, so will you, I can't do it alone. You guys have come with me this far. Will you ride with me? Will you fight with me? I want all of you to be involved. I mean, it was like <laughs> the Reverend Ernest Angley, lay your hands on the radio. And he said, well, all of you stand up and point at the WrestleMania sign with me. It is a classic fucking and they're fucking pointing at the sign. And suddenly the rock music interrupts and he has not been advertised. This is a surprise and the people go batshit. And there's the, that you were talking about, there's the shot and he's coming down like the, you know, the fucking bad guy in a cowboy movie down the streets of fucking Dodge city. Try not to step and cow shit. And Rock gets in the ring and they bring the music down. And that took three minutes of just the Rock walking to the ring and them having the fucking stare down with each other. And then once the music comes down, they stare at each other with the game faces and various inflections and glances and et cetera, with the fans chanting everything from, you know, Rocky to Cody to this is awesome, whatever. They stood there and stared at each other and nothing happened for over three minutes. And then Rock walked up to Cody and whispered something that you couldn't hear because they didn't have the microphones up. And he turned around and walked out. And I will, I've got to be honest, at the time I was thinking, oh, geez, if that's it, I'm, I'm afraid that might not have worked well because not only did they milk these people seeing the rock live and he never spoke a word to him or did anything, but that was kind of fucking flat, right? But at the same time with what dramatic foreshadowing drum roll, please brunch, with what happened later on, it, it, it works, but I was concerned for a while that what happened later wouldn't happen later. What about you? Well, until we saw what happened later, I was more concerned about the dynamic I've talked about before. Cody's doing his promo, and it's good, and he's getting a good reaction, but it seems like there is an element of a mixed reaction there. And then The Rock gets the surprise babyface pop. People were delighted to see him there, and it overshadows Cody. By the way, you know who everyone keeps forgetting about, including me? Roman Reigns. <laughs> Isn't that who Cody's feuding with? You forget about the guy. The guy's the champion. He's not even around. But it, I was intrigued. You know, it was like lost in translation. What did he whisper to Scarlett Johansson? What did The Rock say to him? Was it, notice I picked on your mom and not Brandy? I'm smart? I don't know, but I was intrigued by it. It was good. And again, keeps you guessing. Didn't know The Rock was going to be back out later on at the very, very, very end. But it was an intriguing segment. Well, and, and apparently now the latest that I have heard is that the, the it has been revealed that, because later on in the show, Cody made a reference to, he was asked what Rock said, and he said that he made a promise he can't keep. And what they're saying now is Rock whispered, I'm going to make you bleed tonight, which as we'll get there. But, uh, but again... When you talk about Rocky getting a pop, Rocky, yeah, you know me and Rocky, we hang out. Um, when you talk about the Rock getting a pop and a cheer, here's the thing: a lot of these people are going to cheer the Rock because it's the Rock, whether he's a heel or a babyface or whatever. Because especially the the ones here, they're seeing him in person. And yes, the company's been hot, and they're not just selling. 7,500 of the 15,000 tickets because they thought Rock might be there. But on a surprise, and also, th this is good for business because The Rock has been advertised. And normally you would say, yeah, if The Rock shows up, it's a big deal. They got to schedule it. They're going to advertise it. 
when he shows up as a surprise, this goes back to the to the old days. If you don't do it too much, a surprise on a program like this, and don't beat it into the ground, you can put in people's mind, shit, we never know when The Rock's going to show up now. He doesn't have to be advertised, or we could see Roman Reigns or whatever, so we better buy the fucking ticket if they're here in town. Because fuck, The Rock might be here. That type of thing. And it's better to do a surprise on a show that's already a sellout, so you don't have to second guess and say, oh, how many more tickets would we have sold if we had announced The Rock? Exactly. But a lot of the people there are such diehard, you know, loyal fans that if they get The Rock for a surprise, they get The Rock advertised. And The Rock say, hey, they're still going to cheer him because it's The Rock and they're going to see him live. But it's eyeballs and just people buying tickets. And, you know, the, 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 when you've got a dynamic like that, you've got to work with the fact that there's going to be a dueling response, but nobody's pissing on either side. The fans are not pissing on either side. So that's not a problem. But a good opening for the show, intriguing segment, and again, to bring up what I said earlier, the camera work when The Rock came out was fantastic. Presenting him as a heel with that camera angle looks so good. It was great. And, you know, then that was 20 minutes into the program, and then basically besides spots and little, you know, backstage, hi, what color underwear are you wearing, all that blah, 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 blah. What we got for the next 40 minutes was the Judgment Day playing darts in their clubhouse and spilling their plans to rule the world in front of everybody in a conversational fashion. And then Ricochet versus J.D. McFunco. And that was, uh, then we were at five minutes to nine o'clock Eastern by the time that that was done. So this is, again, this three-hour program is built around the in-ring dramatic soliloquies and conversations amongst the stars with filler in the middle to keep the people apprised of what's going to come up next, the next monologue or the next presentation. Can you deny that? I can deny that I watched a ricochet match just because I was waiting for CM Punk. You know, I thought they would start with Punk when they didn't. Now you're just waiting for, is it going to be nine or 10 o'clock? And I was waiting for nine o'clock. <laughs> well, and as I mentioned earlier in the clip we played, if you're listening to this as a complete entity of a podcast or a program, uh, I was trying to hang around and see if Punk was going to show up, and then Harley had her situation. But what happened apparently as I watched the next day was it we're about five o'clock till the nine o'clock hour, or five o'clock. We're five o'clock to the we're, nine o'clock hour here at the Cat Scan Show. Well, we're, it could be 25 or six to four now. <laughs> we were five minutes to nine o'clock, is what I'm trying to say. A big uh, turning point in the ratings. And suddenly, like Mussolini, making me trend. Here came our old friend, Phil, CM Punk. And now we're just going, we've already talked about, and <clears throat> if you didn't hear it, folks, you can search it out, the clip on why we were forced to reference by the, the throngs of the cult of Cornette. We were forced to reference that Punk referenced us while he was referencing other people. But now we're going to talk about what the actual segment was. And, you know, again, I noted camera work on the entrances you know, is fucking great, and Punk loves to, he's in his hometown, and he brings the people into it, he doesn't just go around and shake hands like every dry baby face, you know, he's up on the fucking desk, he, you know, he milks almost the whole song, because <clears throat> if they're paying for it, why not? And, again, he talks to them and not at them. And the story he was telling was, is he going to be at WrestleMania? Well, a short version is yes, but to do what? And that's where should he be a host or should he referee? And he had the interchange with Pat McAfee about the podcast they listen to. And then, you know, he, he knocks Seth a little bit. And he said that somebody that hasn't mentioned me is The Rock. And... Uh, I, we're not up, I'm not up, you may know, but he, he said uh, the, the history 10 years ago when I went face to, or when The Rock went face to face with the Second City Saint, 
His arms were too short to box with God. Now, do we have a CM Punk victory in the archives over the rock? Or could that, or is, is he talking about a promo where he scorched him? Or what is that history? Was it the rock's appearance that actually triggered the pipe bomb originally? The promo? It may have been. Because Punk was the champion, but The Rock was coming and getting pushed right to the top? Well, we, there, we all talk about the pipe bomb, but you never think about what triggered it. I think that may have been it. Yes, what was the detonator switch? So, well, there, well then in that case, then, boom. I, I was hoping they had footage of him beating The Rock they could show sometime. But nevertheless. Uh, but he, he promoted Drew McIntyre. And he said, if you got a problem, you know, let's handle it face to face, you know, motherfucker. And, and also and he had made a couple of, uh, you know, other witty remarks about his language and, you know, they're not on Netflix yet and whatever. But when he started talking about Drew, boom, here came Drew's music. And this turned into some different shit as soon as they did this, because as Drew's coming out with his entrance music, instead of punk being like every other dipshit in the world and standing there and just letting the music play and blah, blah, blah. Punk is on a microphone. Cut that bullshit music off, right? But turn that shit off. And, and he told it, get your bitch ass in here. Are you a Scottish psychopath and a kilt or an internet troll in a skirt? It is uh, automatically we've got goddamn actual people arguing with each other again instead of these fucking dramatic renditions of Shakespeare. And Drew McIntyre is great. And he was crowing about, you know, Punk would be at his mercy because he's hurt in the ring and he's wearing the T-shirt where he has the tombstone of Punk's mania main event or whatever. And Punk said, I never had to put another man's name on a shirt to sell it. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's not the bullshit that these phony fucking writers hand guys. These are these guys doing this shit. Or at least they're uh, modifying it and delivering it well because nobody else has been talking like this. And... <laughs> Drew got back. You don't drink or do drugs, but you spend all your time in rehab because there's Punk with his arm brace on. That was fucking classic. And then they, they Punk did the deal where he laid down in the ring, but Drew got up on the desk and got cross-legged like Punk sits. And Drew is gloating because he's the, the in the position that Punk wants to be in. He's the chosen one. And Punk got up and said, who chose you? What, what paragon of virtue chose you to be the chosen one? Say his name. Oh, fuck, that was fucking great. And they got the shot right on Drew's face when Punk said his eyes got a yes. little wide. You know, you didn't expect that. Yes. Well, yeah, because that's what it's supposed to be. Well, you see an opening, boom. And so then... Uh, somehow Drew, after they just did some great shit, the piece of business they're trying to do is that Drew challenged Punk, sit there at ringside, be the guest commentator for my match at WrestleMania, and sit there and have to watch me win, right? Win the title, my crowning achievement, and I'll rub it in your face. And then Seth's music starts playing. And as soon as he hears Seth's music... <laughs> Punk starts hitting himself in the head with the microphone slowly, like, what the fuck, another one of these motherfuckers? And Seth comes into the ring with Punk and the singing and the woeing, and then as soon as they bring it down, then the people in Chicago start chanting CM Punk, CM Punk. And, of course, Seth Franklin Rollins has to welcome everybody to Monday Night Rollins in Punk's face, but then, you know, got some drowned out by some some more chance and punks. Hey, it's your show, but it's my city. And Seth, I, I guess they just put Seth out there to make sure that he was represented because he didn't add a lot to this. He, he said, you can't make decisions about a match that you're not in and I'm the champion. So let's take a fan poll. Did that make any sense? Brian? Not really, but at least the fans that were polled said, yes, we'd like to see punk do the announcing. Actually, the fans first said, uh, chanted, referee, referee. 
And Punk said he couldn't be he couldn't be a fair referee with these two dipshits involved. They bleep dipshits, but so anyway, um Seth told Punk stay out of his way, and then Punk said, Okay, you know, I'll be the announcer. And he basically he wound it up with I'll I'll do what both of you could never do. I'll make you both sound interesting. And it hit my music, and Punk's music starts playing, and Drew is like, stop it, stop it. And he starts promoing Punk, and while he's doing that, Seth hits Drew with a super kick and a curb stomp, and Drew's on his face, and Punk's in the entryway, and Seth did something. and But it, it was 20 minutes, but it was great, and you couldn't wait to see who, what was going to be said next by who. This was a fantastic segment. Drew McIntyre went from being boring to me thinking he needed time away just because nothing was happening. Yeah. Now I'm intrigued by him. Intrigued more by his personality than his matches, to be fair. But whenever he's out there and on the mic, stuff's happening. And it's been like this for a few months now. And him and Punk is the real dynamic. And then you get the Punk Rollins stuff. You know, Drew at least, I don't know, with Drew at least it was a back and forth. You know, Punk and Rollins, it was a one-sided thing. Rollins' music is over. Once the music ends and he's acting silly or trying to keep up with these two guys on the mic, I don't think it worked yeah. as well. Yeah. But great segment. And again, I don't know when Punk will be cleared. I got to think it's not going to be for a while. But if they get him on the show and they get segments like this, look at that number. How do you not do more stuff like this? Well, but you got to be careful. You can't just, uh, okay, here he is now every week, folks, and he's going to come out and say something. It still has to be special until they're ready to pull the trigger on something. But, uh, uh, you know, again, it sounds like actual, this sounds like an argument that Austin and Rock would have had 25 years ago. Except, you know, different personalities involved. But it's not this scripted you know, memorized, homogenized, pasteurized bullshit that we're used to. It's a, at least a little, a little fucking entertaining arguing instead of that. But then we came back with a girls match. And then we came back with a new day against DYI. And, or DY, do it yourself, do it yourself, DIY. And then they had Da Vinci versus Andre. And I'm thinking, well, there's been a lot of matches. And then suddenly we got back to wrestling. At the 10 o'clock hour was Rhea Ripley in the ring with Dominic Mysterio. And I must admit that I had, uh, at this point, I've had a little promo fatigue because how are you going to top the, you know, Cody's and then, you know, especially the Punk and Drew and blah, blah, blah. But it's Rhea. And she spoke for just a second, and then boom, and they played the music, and now they got Becky coming out. And so they pro and B Becky is very good, and Rhea, as we've talked about, is a prodigy with promos. Just, I don't know with everything, actually, but I don't know how she's gotten this, this good, but she has. But anyway, it was very good back and forth, and heartfelt about Rhea telling Becky that Becky's daughter is going to call me mommy and Becky got pissed because her father didn't get to see her baby so it's not a joke to her and I, Brian I think some women actually watch the WWF these days right or WWE um, unlike an AEW product so they're probably appealing to some women with the, the baby talk and everything or the talking about the baby not the baby they weren't the going goo goo ga oh I'm gonna beat you up you yeah, big oh, tough no, Rhea Ripley -ga -ga. come get oh, me open up the hangar and let the airplane land but uh, <laughs> no I mean the you know <laughs> what that's the way you make the baby open the mouth to eat the, eat the pudding or the gruel or whatever oh, you feed the, babies the gruel the pudding the hanger. <laughs> what is going on? But anyway, they weren't baby talking to each other. They were talking about the baby. Is what they were doing. They were talking about the baby. And then they got face to face. And Dominic got in between them. And Becky punched Dominic. <laughs> and the girls got in a fight. And the shot she gave Dom. I know. 
he probably said, yeah, go ahead and hit me, make it look good. But she pushed him right in the fucking jaw. Um, and the girls fought and Rhea posted Becky and was going to help Dominic up. But then here came Becky came back and they got in a fight in the aisle way and had a pull apart with the referee. This was above the level of anything in terms of promo and physical execution that you're going to see probably on any random AEW television program. And it's their female division here. But this was three in a row for the live interview segments. They, it was good. We had some fatigue after the first two, but it was still, it was, it was good, good stuff. Good stuff. What'd you think? You're a big Becky fan. I'm a big Rhea fan. I think Becky's all right. You know, when you see her next to Rhea, you realize, I don't know. I don't know if Becky's gotten smaller or whatever it is, but Rhea just, Rhea's in such great shape right now. There is a size discrepancy. There is. You know, it's been a while since they've done something like this with Dominic and Rhea together, so it kind of gives you a little bit of that. And yeah, I thought it was a good segment. I mean, they started every hour with a good segment. And then the pesky wrestling starts And then again. those matches, but none of the matches contain any of the people in the good segments, so it kind of works. Yeah. That's when you get a hot dog, you get some popcorn. <laughs> or if you're in the arena, you get a hot dog and you get some popcorn. <laughs> Whatever it may be. Well, and then we had a hot dog versus popcorn, Bronson Reed versus Sami Zayn, where Gunther distracted um, Sami by standing there in the arena, along with another 15,000 people. And Bronson splashed Sami and, and beat him. And again, we're getting Gunther and Sami at the, uh, the pay-per-view. It could have been Gunther and Brock. And, you know, the rating scale may have been broken over here. And then we got Shaky Nakamura and Jay Uso in our television main event, which went about like you would expect it would until finally at ringside, Jimmy Uso and Solo appear. I know you're never going to believe this, but they, they just, they appeared. But suddenly Cody and Seth tackled them and got a big fight. And Cody fought Jimmy through... <laughs> Cody fought Jimmy. It sounds like I'm a high school fucking. Cody fought Jimmy through the entrance way while Seth and Solo stayed out at ringside, which allowed Drew McIntyre to bombard Seth from behind and run him into the post and then DDT him on the floor. So Seth Rollins is out of action. He's incapacitated. But in the ring, the match was still going on. So Jay hit Shaky with a spear, boom, one, two, three. But meanwhile, Cody and Jimmy were in the back of the arena and fought out into the back door in the rain. It rainy night in Chicago. Just a rainy night oh, in Chicago. Oh, come on, come on. We're in the middle of a big review. And then suddenly two wrestlers fight out the back door. So they fought out the back door is what they did. Is that what they did? That's what they did. And then, boom, boom, boom. Uh, fucking, well, they, he threw Jimmy out the back door, and he turned around, and he beat up Solo, and then The Rock, The Rock, suddenly, out of nowhere from behind, tackled fucking Cody and hammered him and beat him up with everything in the fucking back area there and ran him into the walls. And then threw him out the back door into the rain and followed him out there. And now we know Seth Rollins, Seth Franklin Rollins, Cody's partner in the big greatest tag match ever has been laid out by Drew McIntyre at ringside. What we don't know is why that no other motherfucker Thank from you. a baby face. <laughs> Thank you. I thought you were going to ignore that because it was the rock. That was my biggest issue. What we don't know, I got to get the caveat out. What we don't know is why that every other baby face in the locker room or every referee or every official with the promotion that is, or anybody that has a monetary interest in the WrestleMania main events happening as they are advertised or the Chicago police department. 
Adam I Pierce. Guess, Where's Adam Pierce? Adam Pierce. Adam Pierce wasn't even on the show here. Did, was he? Did I miss him when I zipped through all the backstage bullshit? Oh, I don't know. Now you're making me doubt it, too. Forget well, but, but also, what about the Rosemont? I know the Chicago PD are out of jurisdiction. Rosemont, Illinois, has two deputies and a, and a mail clerk. So they could have sent... They don't have a squad car. They've got a fucking sidecar, but they could have sent somebody over. But nobody try as this thing goes very long. And it was good. Rock is kicking his shit out of Cody and running him into everything and beating him up and kicking him and trash talking him. And he runs Cody into the bus and Cody comes up bleeding. And Rock's cutting the promo on him the whole time, getting bleeped every once in a while. And then wipes Cody's blood on the weight belt and cuts the promo to Mama Rhodes. And then, and he's fulfilled what he whispered to Cody and then he told Cody. And they played this unedited, obviously, on the big screen in the building because all the people popped, but he's got Cody bleeding and beat up and shirt ripped off and he's trash talking him and he looks at his face and he says this is what happens when you fuck with the final boss and they bleeped the word fuck on tv but the people heard it they popped it was a great action outside we had legitimate blood which we've needed in angles like this it's the rock it's cody it's before wrestlemania but nobody tried to do any fucking thing to get in the way yeah, I mean, let's, and, talk, let's talk about the positives. The Rock was great as a heel here. Cody took a great ass kicking. The rain added a lot. Yeah. It added a lot. It looked great back then. I mean, it just it looked great, but no one did anything. Dusty Rhodes regularly got his ass kicked. And if it was in a cage, baby faces would be trying to climb that thing like they were trying to get money. Yes. And if it was just him getting his ass kicked, the baby faces, baby faces you didn't even realize were friends with him would hit the ring to try to stop whatever was happening and protect him and at times cradle him. I mean, it was ridiculous. They, they, would, be, they would be thrown out or laid out or they'd be locked in a, a fucking room somewhere or there would be some level of Something. explanation, Something. right? And that's just Dusty as an example because when we're talking Cody, a lot of times you think about the way Dusty would do things. That was the thing missing. The Rock kicking Cody's ass was great. The Rock was great here. But it went like five minutes. If it didn't go five minutes, it felt like it went five minutes with no one except the cameraman. Yes. Seemingly aware of this. The monitors must have all been turned off. <laughs> and at some point you would think the cameraman might say, you know, he's, he's really, he might hurt this guy real bad. Maybe I ought to call somebody. Just anything. Baby faces trying to get through the door. Baby faces getting tossed away by someone. I don't even know who. Solo. Something. Because, because, because the, that's the thing is they've made Solo a monster. Well, Cody fucking, I can't remember what he did to Solo, but he whacked him with something pretty good at the back door, and then we never saw him again. Five minutes later, he'd have been hit by a fucking truck. And so I know they can't, they don't want to distract attention and focus from their main point but having that on the periphery at the back door just this big skirmish going on people trying to come through they've they pulled a fucking front loader up to the back door they're having to run around the ticket fucking concourse i don't know right but a little service to that would have gone a long way but otherwise great stuff what do you think would end in the show this way well that's <laughs> You know, that's the way the wrestling show used to end with the goddamn biggest deal on it, didn't it? Always. And then we've gotten away from that because the wrestling shows have gotten so long, boring, and monotonous that most of the people are not still there at the end of the thing. But that's really what should happen because that's what used to keep people tuned in was to see the the main event or the whatever was going to happen at the end the you know it's breaking down in fucking Tulsa whatever and now it's just kind of a fucking fart when you go off the air sometimes well the guy won play his music we'll see you later well we'll see what happens because that's one of the big differences between Smackdown and Raw Smackdown they'll peak sometimes with the last segment but that's 9.45 to 10 o'clock Raw the last segment is approaching 11pm it's always the lowest of the night 
if you start doing stuff like this, maybe some people will hang around. I mean, it'll be interesting. Well, and also with, with, uh, here's another thing. They didn't, they didn't waste anything. We, I know some people will make this correlation, so I will nip it in the bud now. We have blistered Tony Khan in the past for putting a big angle on at the end of the show when the fucking viewership was lowest, right? And he would know that. Why'd you do that, you numbskull? Well, here's the thing. This is raw. They have not only a week and a half or whatever now before WrestleMania, but their highest rated show, SmackDown, that has even more viewers, can recap this on Friday night for the benefit of anybody who may have missed it. So when, when Tony does something on Dynamite, when nobody's watching Dynamite, there's still more people that's watching any of his other shows that he can recap it on. You see what I'm saying to you? Yeah, I mean, it was an episode that told you you never know when The Rock will be there and you never know when something big will happen at the very end. It'll be interesting the more they start doing things like this, if they do, if it changes the viewing patterns. Yeah, and I think that's that's what they've needed. But that was Raw, and that ended at 11 p.m. And at that point, Jim, depending on what city you are, if you're not in a city, you're shit out of luck. But if you're in a city, maybe you could order some food. It's pretty late. But what do you do? It's Raw. It's over. It's late. <laughs> You need a good, healthy moo. You need a good, healthy moo and a meal. And we know some c -c 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 chef crafted chefs. Uh, actually, the chefs are not crafted. We know some chefs that will craft some stuff for you. And here's the man who will craft the rest of this. Read Mr. Jim Cornette. Oh, my God. You know, and I don't think it's really healthy if you're eating dinner at 11 o'clock at night Eastern. Now, maybe if you're. If you're out there on the West Coast, uh, they, they dine late out there because of all their traffic problems, right? <laughs> but uh, but, what if, but you're not bed, if you're not going to bed till four, that's fine. Did that blow your mind? That No, that, uh, that made me hit my wrong button. But oh. here's the thing that you could do. What you can do is you can just don't think about anything that was just said. Just get that completely out of your mind. And instead, think about being hungry. Folks, a lot of times you're hungry, but you got no time to eat. A lot of times you're hungry, but you got no time to go to the store. A lot of times you're hungry, but you got no time to cook, right? What's a common factor in this whole thread? You got no time. It's a hurry, scurry, hustle, and bustle type of world these days. You're flitting here. You're flitting there. You got work. You got school. You got kids. A lot of people have children. I've, I've heard this is a growing trend. And you don't have time to sit down and shop. And Well, you don't sit down when you shop, unless you're one of those fat fucks that rides around on a goddamn fucking hover around at, at Walmart, but in that case, you're going to die soon anyway. But if you want to well, get well, healthy, let's, folks, let's not talk about when people will die. Let's talk about what people can eat to stay alive. Well, that's because fresh, never frozen food is what you need to eat, and you need to eat more quality stuff than what you might be stuffing down your gullet. But if you don't have any time, you can't spend any time on it. That's why our friends at Factor have the whole thing worked out. At factormeals.com, they will send you meals that are either calorie smart or keto or protein plus or vegan and veggie or veggie. whatever what, whatever you choose they'll send. But they only take two minutes to eat or two minutes to heat. Let me try that you again. You can they eat only... in, in as much time as you need. You there is no time the... limit on how long you need to ingest You can meal. take all the time you want. If you're in a contest, you can eat them in less than two minutes. But they take, they take two minutes to heat, and then you can eat them at your leisure and convenience. Folks, they've got a weekly menu of 35 different options and more than 60 add-ons every week. They got breakfast. They got on-the-go lunch. They got stay-at-home, be hooked up to a machine lunch. They've got snacks. They got beverages, stuff to make you feel good all day long. Apparently, Viagra would be... I guess involved in what? this. No. Well, it said feel good all Vi day long. Viagra is not involved in this in oh, any just, way whatsoever. Just vegan and veggie. Well, not just vegan and veggie, but also keto, also calorie smart. Well, but no smart. Viagra, because a lot of people have gone on this, this new diet that's a fad thing. It's the vegan veggie Viagra diet, but that's not this. Who's doing that? Well, a lot of people out in California... 
But if you're looking for gourmet meals, well, try meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter. I didn't know you could make butter out of truffles. I've had nut butter before. <laughs> what? What's the more you All grind right. up? Right the, down your funnel. Yeah. Grind, you know they also make almond milk. Did you? Know I did that? know that. Of course I yeah. knew that. And nut butter and you can you can choose broccolini and asparagus. Broccolini. I had broccolini. I've had that. That's delicious. Yeah, well, there you go. Have some more. Because these are no fuss, no mess meals. The factor meals eliminate the hassles of prepping, cooking, and cleaning up. You take your little it's actually it's in a little plastic tray. It's like something they'd give you in jail. And once you finish eating out of this, you just fucking toss it in the garbage. It's good to nobody at that point. You're not going to rewash this thing and use it again. So you just eliminate it. And then boom, you're cleaned up. Just heat this up and eat it and then ask no questions and throw the, the evidence away. People will not know where it came from. What? I don't... I don't know and what it has can, to do with anything. Eat it and enjoy it and tell whoever you want that you enjoyed it and you ate it. Well, yeah, if it's any of their business, if they if they question you hard enough, you've got to admit something, you know, go ahead and tell them. And they tailor this to your schedule, folks. You can customize your weekly meals with the flexibility to get as much or as little as you need. Let's say you figure I only need a couple of walnuts and a grape to get me by on Tuesday. But then uh, some days you may want to eat normally as humans would. And you can pause or reschedule deliveries to suit your lifestyle. Let's say you're going to be going down the river for a few months. You can put the pause on it. And that way they won't pile up on your front porch while you're boarding with the warden on the bounty of the county. Folks, again, we're and they're celebrating Earth Day all month long. Now that sounds like a contradiction in terms it should be earth month but only at factormeals.com do you get earth month instead of earth day and you can look out right now for on 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 factormeals.com brian this is very important look out for the earth month eats badge on the menu to determine which of the fine foodstuffs uh, contain the lowest carbon footprint meals so that, that means that these meals, fewer people have stepped on these meals than any of the other regular meals offered at factormeals.com. Some of those get walked on quite often. No. But they've got the Tony Atlas special. No, they don't. Head to factormeals.com right now, folks, slash JCE50. Use that code JCE50 to get 50% off your first box, plus 20% off your next box. When have you ever been able to get money off your first box and money off your second box at the same time? This is unheard of. It's a whole new deal. Factormeals.com slash JCE50. 50% of the code is JCE50. I don't know. You might have to put it in twice. That's because you're going to get two deals. 50% off your first box, 20% off your next box. And then, well, after that, you're going to goddamn get greedy then. So you're not getting any more than that. They've practically given you half your fucking... Well, they've given you more than half your food here. Fucking greedy bastards. No one's being anyway, greedy here, but get your good eats, get the good food, the healthy food, the chef-crafted food from Factor. You, you, you can't even really call them eats. It's not like it's some kind of diner somewhere on the side of the road, some greasy spoon. This, These are chef-crafted, prepared meals here by crafted chefs, and they do arts and crafts. Also, some of... Some of the chefs do arts and crafts as therapy from where they were in the home. No, no one was in the home. The home. No one was in the home, ladies and gentlemen. Well, but you don't know. You know, you know, just by goddamn odds, somebody involved in this whole chain of, of custody here, from the customer to us to the p people over at Factor Meals, has been in a home before, I'm sure probably against their will. You can't just make a blanket statement. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about your home and let's talk about the food in your home, in your kitchen, the food you need to cook and you don't have the yes. time. Treat yourself well with Factor.
right here. Just pop this stuff in and eat it. Like I said, cover your tracks afterwards. They'll be none the wiser. You'll eat it in two minutes or less, guaranteed by Jim Cornette. Yes, just start shoveling it in. Don't even use silverware. No. Folks. No. Seriously, it's delicious, so take your time. It's Well, if it's delicious, you'd want to eat it quicker before somebody steals it from you. But if you take your time, you savor each bite, you savor every taste, you really enjoy the meal. Well, then it might get cold. Well, you can't take too much time. Well, you can't just sit on this forever. Don't sit on this forever, folks. Because sometimes you'd be sitting somewhere else forever. Head to factormeals.com right now slash JCE50 to get all these percentages off all of your food and and don't worry about it It'll, things will be fine that's right they'll be fine with factor what's that promo code one more time jim jce50 well jim let's get all the uh modern wrestling reviews out of the way let's factor them all in here see i tied that in nicely uh -huh. last night as we are recording AEW dynamite aired on tbs and there was another episode, and this one was, I believe, from Quebec. Actually, they were in Quebec City. If they, they, if they were in Quebec, they could be in Montreal. They could be in Verdun. They could be where uh, Quebec is a whole province, Brian. See, first you couldn't speak English, and that. now you don't know your geography. I knew that that was a province. Well, so, you're very so provincial. There. So there. So there. Well, there. And... Name all the provinces. You see, this is a problem, actually, if I could just say, uh -huh. as a quick aside, I think I've had this speech every, like, five years I have to make it. You're Googling this now. No, I'm not Googling anything. I just wanted to say how sad it is. When I was a kid growing up a wrestling fan, it taught me geography. And I don't think the kids today who grow up wrestling fans have that as much. I'm just glad to hear you say the phrase, the kids today. No, seriously, like, I knew, because there was a while, I, are they doing hometowns again? There was a while where there was no hometowns. Or, like, everyone who had a exotic hometown had to move to Tampa. Like yeah, just, yeah. I, you know, I haven't even noticed it's been... I just quit... I tune out the introductions now, because I'm not a fan of any of the announcers. But, yeah, you learn geography. Well, this geography is Quebec City. But now now we're going to learn mathematics. Was there anybody there? I I saw somebody took camera footage of the building in the pan and put it on Twitter, and it looked like a piss hole in a snowbank. But on the show, the crowd shots were tighter than the skin on a hot dog, so you couldn't tell what the fuck was going on otherwise than they had people on part of one side of the bleachers. Do we have any statistics on this thing as I ramble on? Well, according to WrestleTix, who tracks this a day ago, uh, so this would have been... Yesterday before the event, I'll see if there's anything updated. They had 4,117 tickets distributed, which surprises me because I saw pictures of the building and I heard the building and it did not seem like it was that many people. Well, but is this, what's the capacity of the building? Because is this the old building that we used to run back in the day in Quebec City, which seated fucking 17, 18,000, did it not? I'll let you know right now. Hold on. It is the Center Videotron. Well, it sounds like a new, maybe it's just a new name. I don't, we, they fooled us with Allstate Arena. It seats for capacity, uh, ice hockey, 18,259. Jesus Christ. That means if, if they tricked the whole floor out for ringside, we're looking at about 21.5 for wrestling. So they had 4,000. For concerts, 20,396. Oh boy. All right, well, I'm sure the, they got a deal on the rent. They probably had a coupon. Or what? what is it the kids get now, the Groupons or Gropons? Have you ever gotten a Gropon, Brian? I have not, and that's not what they get, and I don't think the kids are paying attention to Groupon. Well, that's one of the new internet things. It's pretty old. Any, anyway, this this we're going to talk about this show and not in specific detail as far as grading the matches or evaluating anybody. This is an open letter to Tony Khan. What the fuck are you doing, son? Because normally I wouldn't pay attention to a lot of these people, but since some of these people have now been given millions of dollars, millions of dollars to do whatever it is they do, I want to see them 
show me they're worth it, right? So I'm going to watch Will Ostrich, and I'm going to watch Mercedes Moan, and I'm going to watch... Nay. Huh? No, I shouldn't watch them? No, Monet, not hey? Moan. Monet. Moany, 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 Moany. Cause you make me feel. Anyway, <laughs> ride the pony. So you just throw random lyrics from random spots of the song out there. <laughs> but anyway, oh. I'm gonna watch these people, Okada, Mr. Okada, in there too, because. I want to see what's worth millions of dollars, Brian. Is that unfair of me to want to watch these people, to have them impress me because they're worth millions of dollars? Well, every wrestling fan has their own reasons for watching these shows, and you are an industry professional, so you're watching this, and you kind of have an idea of some of the budgetary, um, I wouldn't say concerns, yeah. just <laughs> happenstances that are, well, are there. Uh, yeah, the point is, Tony, you're getting schnookered, pal. Because you, if you're going to spend this much money on this talent to get some return on your investment, you need someone producing them to keep them all away from their worst instincts. Because the overriding theme of this particular television broadcast is these guys and girls may have been stars in other environments where they, in Japan, where they weren't produced at all but they know the style that appeals to that market i assume or in the wwe where they were produced down to their fingernails and told exactly what to do because apparently they need it but here they're just twisting in the wind pal you are pouring your money down the porcelain throne because they don't know how to get over they do not know how to get themselves over without people giving them help, material, or producing their matches, or teaching them a little something about the American wrestling business in some cases, all of these things. And it, it this was the most obvious example of that I've ever seen. They opened the show, Will Ostrich versus Shibata. What is our brain joke of the day to get it over with? Uh, here's my joke. I don't think they put this guy's brain back in at all because he doesn't seem to have one because he didn't know his position in this match and nobody explained it to him. It, Will Ostrich has been signed for however much money and this guy goes out there and doesn't sell anything he does to him and kicks the shit out of him through the whole fucking match. And, uh, and the focus is supposed to be on our friend Will here. And I mean, at least when he comes out to wrestle, he's dressed up. Because normally he just wears the the T-shirt or the pants or whatever the fuck he happens to walk into the building at. But now he's wrestling, so he's, he's got a feathered robe. It looks like Sergeant Pepper's lingerie, but at least it's something. But they have put him... In this position, what is this, his second or third match on television? So for many people, if they missed one or two of those shows, this is the first time they've seen this fucking guy they've heard talked about. They put him against a complete unknown for 20 minutes. Who kicks the shit out of Mr. Superstar, Mr. Six Million Dollar Man, who sells almost nothing? Shabbat is in good shape. He's wearing black trunks and boots. He's got absolutely zero facial expression. He makes Johnny Gargano look like Charlie Callis. And Ostrich is a baby face, but Shibata doesn't heal at all. He has no emotion whatsoever. He's just doing a bunch of moves. But throughout this match, and Brian, I can't count how many, Maybe you took a tally on it. Will would hit Shibata with repeated forearms and Shibata would stand there and stare at him and not even register it. Registering in wrestling means you don't sell it, you don't look like it affects you, but you move with the blow. You register it. And he wasn't registering. And then he would turn around and hit Ostrich with one shot and... 
Will would be not goofy and drunken legged. And the the way they set this thing up at the beginning, there was a VTR of Shibata beating Ostrich seven years ago in a match in Japan. And not even cheating, not even fucking him, just beating him. And because of that, apparently Tony thinks that an audience on television now in another country seven years later will be on the edge of their seats for a match between the new guy they just signed and a guy that nobody's ever fucking heard of. And Sockface chimed in, by the way, well, the last time that Shibata beat Will, Ostrich was under 100 kilograms. What the fuck does that even equal? What is that, like a drug measurement? Well, he was caught with 100 kilograms. What is he... Is, is Sockface American? Can I, he I count so. like us? Can, can he speak to us so we understand this shit? Well, he can't do that. He is an inept commentator. <sighs> He's completely mediocre, and uh, it needs to be said once again. All right, well, anyway, so through this match, again... Shibata beats Ostrich up. Ostrich makes a comeback, and then Shibata just stops selling like Brody when he didn't cooperate with somebody and kicks the shit out of Ostrich again. And then th there was a couple of series. Uh, uh, Shibata out-wrestles Will. Will gives Shibata a German suplex. Shibata is up to his feet first, and German suplexes Will. Will pops right up and does a handstand flip. But both guys' forearms were looking fake, but they would do dozens, and then Shibata would uncork one. It looked real and knock Ostrich, Ostrich goofy. But, I mean, there was a point where Will hits the Cody cutter and gets a one count, and Shibata popped up to his feet and just knocked Ostrich out with a clothesline. It didn't make uh, any sense whatsoever. So here's the finish, Brian. Will hits a super kick, and Shibata doesn't even go down. Will then turns his back on Shibata. He's only a foot away, but he stands there until Shibata gets a sleeper on him. And then Will gives him a belly-to-back suplex and an elbow to the face and gets a two count. Then he gives him a power bomb, and Shibata sits up and growls at him. And Will hits him with another elbow, one, two, three. So all that shit they did in that match, and then Will ends up doing two or three moves in a row and just beats him flat with the shittiest-looking thing in the whole match, the elbow, all the big bumps and everything didn't work. But 20 minutes bell-to-bell, -bell, complete unknown against the new multi-million dollar man, and the new multi-million dollar man looks like he won by the skin of his teeth and the other guy's fucking tougher. You cannot let these guys set up their own matches. This is what you get because nobody has fucking smartened them up. Your thoughts. We didn't even get to see his finishing maneuver, the Shibata me. <laughs> I had the same thoughts as you, and obviously you are an industry professional. I'm just a putz. But Will Ospreay's come out there and done promos the last few weeks. And the fans have reacted to him. And they're bringing signs with his catchphrase, and they're chanting it. And in shows that have done... Lower and lower numbers, although not the big pop that things used to be, it has his segments have caused things to go up at least a little bit. He's been presented to the best of Tony's abilities as a star you should care about. He needed a five minute win where the entire time he could look flashy for those fans and get them on their feet. The crowd went to sleep pretty quickly. Not that they didn't appreciate these guys. Not that they didn't get into the moments that sometimes it feels almost like they feel obligated to get into or react to. The trading spots thing is the dumbest thing in the world at this point. And I don't know who to blame if it's New Japan or if it's all the wrestlers trying to copy what they think you're supposed to do from watching Japanese tapes. But it's the dumbest thing and it doesn't get the crowd going. The crowds are getting more and more subdued so the people that like this match, in a vacuum, maybe it was a good match. Shibata's never been presented 
in a memorable way in any way ever on this show. And he's starting off the show against the guy that's been brought in and been presented to the best of their abilities as a star. And it took him 20 minutes. This is one of those episodes I can't wait to see the ratings because it's going to tell an interesting story. I, I, I saw Hotchkiss Featherbottom this morning. And he used to wrestle a bit for OVW back in the day, I'll have you know. And, I, and he was well aware of his place in the hierarchy and the pecking order, whatever. And I said, what if when Steve Austin came to the... Because he was a great worker. But I said, what if Steve Austin, when he came to the gardens, I'd come up to you and I'd said, okay, it's, it's you and Austin. We're, you're going to go 20 minutes. You'll have a great match with him. That's why it's, boy, you'll have a great match. He can do these moves and you can do those moves. He said to me, he said, I would have thought you were out of your mind because nobody wanted to fucking see me. He was the star. Steve Austin was the star. If, if that match had happened, it would have been three or four minutes, kick, stunner, pose, blah, 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 whatever the fuck. But nobody is smart to the wrestling business anymore. They're just taught to do a bunch of moves and have the best match with everybody they possibly can. And it's just so heartwarming. And then these two nitwits, after they had this match, which cost Tony a million dollars off of the potential of Ostrich, off of his contract, they got on their knees, bowed to each other, shook hands, and hugged. <sighs> and for people, once again, yes, fuck Shibata. I don't care about his brain or lack thereof or whatever. No, he has it. No lack thereof, he has okay, it. Okay, all right, but, to, but he, the, they, they took it and then they brought it back. But nevertheless, I don't dislike him because he's Japanese. I dislike him because he's doing stupid shit in a wrestling ring. And because he's not a good wrestler because he doesn't know how to do this properly. I don't dislike Japanese people. I dislike bad Japanese wrestlers. I don't dislike... Homosexual people, I dislike bad homosexual wrestlers. I don't dislike female people. I dislike bad female wrestlers. Do you see a pattern developing here? <sighs> well, again, I'm not saying Shabbat is a bad wrestler. He's, he, he's maybe... wor he is actually worse than some of these fucks that have just started that are greener than grass, but they're trying because he does shit that's obviously fake and he's supposed to be a fucking experienced professional. That's, wor that's worse than being a green dipshit that doesn't know what you're doing and your shit looks bad. Well, what we can agree on is that he hasn't been presented in any way that would cause fans to really care unless you're someone who watches New Japan on Access TV and they don't even get ratings. So... That's what I'm saying. One way or another, this was... It just seems like a counterproductive move in terms of getting Will Ospreay over as a top star. <sighs> But we got more to go because there's much more money has been spent on these people. And speaking of spending money in an unfortunate manner, the buckaroos were in the back doing more of their fake douchebaggery promo type of thing with Rene Moxley Good. And they're going to wrestle later on tonight, oh joy, oh bliss. Uh, because it's the tag team championship tournament. Uh, now that they've vacated their tag team title or at least they haven't had a tournament in what six eight weeks now right so the buckaroos and wwe's doing one too well of course you know they are the buckaroos against private party and remember the other fucking guy they paid a fortune to uh okada well, his contribution to this television program was to watch this sorry-ass fucking match on the monitor and nod while having no expression on his face. So, let's say let's say he's getting two million a year. They said four million in the newspapers. Let's let's wrestlers exaggeration. If he's getting two million a year, that's a million dollars every six months. That's five hundred grand every three months. That's two hundred and fifty grand in six weeks. That's about fucking forty or fifty grand a week, almost, right? And since he he didn't do anything else on this show, I assume 
they paid him forty or fifty thousand dollars to stand there and watch that monitor. Can you dispute my mathematics? Well, I don't know. I mean, again, I don't know if that car did they just bring it around to each town, or did they shoot this? I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. Well, anyway, so the match, Buckaroo's private party. Everything that you would expect, rotten basics, no psychology, choreographed tumbling, the Cucamonga kids bringing out the worst instincts of Quinn and Cassidy because they've never been trained by proper adult professionals and don't know that this is not all about this goddamn Western swing dancing they're doing in the ring. Uh, constant four ways, the worst referee in the history of wrestling standing there and staring as two middle-aged children play wrestle with their friends. And then here's the finish. <laughs> That's verbatim what someone, a top wrestler in this business, texted me in, this middle of the, in the middle of this match and just said, the worst referee ever. Well, I mean, how can, how can there be a, any kind of competition? Who else has ever been allowed to be this bad without being fired? He's friends with the buckaroos, so... He gets by with it. And they don't want a referee because then they would have to actually learn how to do this properly instead of just busting out into whatever the fuck they want to do. So, Nikki brings the bell, the ring bell, into the ring, and the referee grabs the bell away from him, doesn't call for the disqualification, just goes to the corner to hand it out and turns his back for like a minute so Maddie kicks Cassidy in the balls, but then Quinn has one of the title belts and hits Matt over the head with that. And then the referee turns around and sees Cassidy covering Maddie. And it's a two count, but Maddie put Nikki or no, he's hitting one of the other ones, put the other leg on the ropes. I don't know, but it was a two count. So then Quinn missed the cannonball off the top, and the buckaroos went for the shitty double knee lift, and that's what Nikki draws back and slips and falls down in the middle of the ring. The, the other brother does the knee, and then Nikki, that slipped and fell down, jumped up and did a knee about two seconds later, and the <laughs> poor guy didn't know whether to go down, wind his ass, scratch his watch. Where, what's, what are they hitting me with? They're falling all over me. Once you trip, what should you do? He should. Matt hit him with the knee lift. He should have got up and they should have shot the guy off and done another fucking move or picked the guy up and done another fucking move. But they're not smart enough. And, it, 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 and Shivani trying to cover up for it said, well, they switched up the V-trigger. There was a little hesitation there. Yeah, because the fucking guy fell down. We all saw it. And the people were like, when they're milking the thing, the people are, hey, and then he fucking falls and they fumble it all up and the people are like, Ugh. And then, if you noticed, both of the heels covered the baby face and the referee dropped down and counted. Which is, is everything about this match in front of the referee was totally fucked up, but he doesn't even know. He's not smart enough. The corpse referee I'm talking about, he's not even smart enough to know how wrestling's supposed to be done. He's never worked any, anywhere for anybody except these guys and their vanity promotion in Rosita. So it, this, is, this was a fucking mess. Again, I say Mark Quinn is an outstanding athlete. At one time, he deserved better. I don't know where the fuck he's been or what the fuck's going on with him now. Any closing thoughts on that? Oh, by the way, the Buckaroos advance. They continue on to eventually to their march trying to regain the tag team title in this tournament that nobody gives two flying shits about. And then whoever wins the tag team championship gets to challenge the Blackpool Combat Club for uh, something. <laughs> and, and, and that's another thing, since they were left out of the tournament because the plumber doesn't want to do a job, then the Buckaroos have to win because the, then that's the team they would be facing. So they've, they're already calling this goddamn thing. Bucks FTR in the yeah. finals? Uh, probably just so the FTR can do another job and make the Bucks look good. Well, then it's even. Then it's, uh, I guess it would be 2-2. Two, two. It's, it's far from even at this point. <laughs> I think we can. And speaking of far from even, 
and far from sane and logical. So Darby Allen was on the show in a in a, a videotape with a the skateboarder fellow. What's the skateboarder's name? Tony Hawk. He's a a legendary skateboarder, maybe the greatest of all time. Also, someone who uh, Cast Media owes money to. Well, I, I sympathize with him on that. As far as being the greatest skateboarder of all time, in my opinion, that's again like being the nicest guy in prison. It's a, a apt simile there because fucking skate. Here's the thing: what they're doing is they're raising money for a good cause, allegedly. I'm not saying allegedly raising money. I'm saying it's allegedly a good cause. Darby apparently was going to climb Mount Everest to try to raise money for this fucking skateboarder fellow, old Rip Hawk there. To Tony do- Hawk, he's very famous. Okay, well, I, like I give a shit about a, a fucking skateboarder is a person getting in the way of the general population as they make their way about the sidewalks and byways of America what do you have and attempting to fucking break their goddamn own neck when there's no fucking reason whatsoever. Any of those great movies that you remember with skateboarding, like Gleaming the Cube and uh, The Police Gleaming Academy? Gleaming the Cube? It's a good movie from the late 80s. Any of those movies, him and his friends were the ones doing these stunts and sometimes appearing in those movies. I was in my mid to late 20s in the late 80s and I wasn't looking at movies about skateboarding. And when I was a young man, most people had enough sense to goddamn not get on a skateboard and attempt to break all their bones. They were on some roller skates and they broke a lot of bones. There's like 30 people screaming because I mentioned Gleaming the Cube. Well, you, if you gleam the cube, you'll get a lot of people to scream. That's fucking sensitive down there. But anyway, Darby's with the skateboarding guy, and he can't climb Mount Everest because he broke his foot, so they're raising money for skate parks for these needy children, and they had footage of the kids in the skate park. But here's the thing. Again, Darby Allen, maybe a wonderful sentiment, but isn't this somewhat misplaced? I would not uh, think anything different from this knucklehead. Give your money and and give your time and raise money not to feed needy children, but to encourage them to break their bones while they live in a country with no health care. So you'll wind up sleeping in your car homeless like Darby Allen used to be because you fucked yourself up and you can't pay a doctor bill. Well, to be fair, I think Darby was more homeless by choice. Well, even another reason why I suspect his fucking decision-making capabilities. Anyway, I'm not up for spending money on on building the skate parks for the needy kids, but if, if, if we do feed them from time to time, I help out with that. So if somebody comes up with something where they're feeding some children, instead of encouraging them to fling themselves on concrete, get back with me. Did you see about Jericho making this offer to Hook? What do you think about Jericho's offer to give advice and mentorship and and friendship and fellowship and all these other ships uh, to Hook? You think Hook's ship is about to sail? You know, you can look at it two ways. You could look at this as Jericho being selfless and trying to help elevate a young talent. Or you could look at this as the AEW fans are completely sick of Chris Jericho, he needs someone new to latch onto to suck the life out of. And Hook is there. Fresh blood. Fresh blood. Fresh meat. Do you want to see that? I mean, the crowd doesn't react to Jericho. The loss of Judas has exposed that greatly. He doesn't look good in the ring. Hook? I mean, at least he hasn't been jobbed out. I mean, he's still... They, I mean, they, they like Hook naturally. He's got a natural... They like, regardless of the goofy booking, they just, they like the kid. So Because there's two logical ends to this. One is they continue on with this great relationship where Jericho's his old coach and friend forever. Strangler Lewis the Luthez. <laughs> or Jericho turns on him. And then we have that great feud which nobody wants. Well, and, and Hook has acknowledged, yeah, I know who you are, Chris, but just remember, I know who you are. Well, hopefully when, when Chris is sitting down in front of the fireplace with his new young protege there, he'll tell him, some more, support democracy. Don't ever let your wife go to any insurrections against the United States government. That type of character-building advice that all young men should get from their, their father figure. Do you agree with me, what I'm saying about 
Exactly. That's the whole fucking... It, 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 this can't be a long-term friendship or tag team because that won't go anywhere. So something's going to happen if they get that fight, unless they just cut it off, unless they just don't follow through with what they're prefacing here. But otherwise, Jericho's going to stab him in the back and then work a program with him where he can get some response while at the same time probably uh, uh, diminishing Hook's luster along the way. Well, you know, Jim, Hook is from St. Mark's Place. It's very easy to get some piercings over there. Well, it used to be. And now it's like NYU. The hell? Where is this going? Well, maybe he can get some fancy earrings to distract from the Raycon earbuds that'll put in his ear so he doesn't have to listen to Chris Jericho talk, let alone sing. Well, you know, so that what you're saying is that's why that when you took me around town there to all the hip, cool coffee shops and beatnik hangouts there in, in the, the Big Apple that... <laughs> In my time machine, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, you know, they were they were playing the bongos and they had the Gilligan haircuts and yes, we went to Cafe Wa. And that one place where they had that big Venus flat trap in the corner, they were feeding it hamburger, that one, I'll tell you, but but that's that's what it was. It, it's it's all about that. And and where were we going? Oh, I'll tell you where we're going. We're going to the Raycons, because the Raycons, ladies and gentlemen, that's why when you took me, Brian, to that neighborhood, all those people that we encountered walking down the sidewalk, they were either just shaking their heads to and fro or nodding their heads up and down, or some of them were even singing to themselves. And that's because they all had the Raycon wireless earbuds in, listening to the soundtrack that they had determined was best for their own life. Is that what you're saying to me right now? Yeah, and sadly, the village has lost that spirit. You mean, well, that's because they need more Raycons. I'm telling you right now, if anybody's in the in the vicinity of what is that Greenwich Village? Greenwich Village. Yes, or Greenwich, the East Village specifically. Greenwich Village, or over there in the east part of the that village there. If you take a bunch of Raycons, tackle some motherfucker and start shoving these. No, in his ears. do so not. Do, thank you for no, it. No, do not do that. Do not do Turn that. Turn them on to some really fucking head banging tunes where when you shove these things in their ears and they get up when they're chasing you. They're going to hear, they may have blood in their eye, but they'll have music no, and they love in their don't ears. Don't do this. Listen, it's not like the old days. It won't be a wino. Not that that's excusable. It'll be some NYU kid, some rich, spoiled brat living in the village. Don't do that. Well, because, hey, a rich, spoiled brat probably won't be able to run that fast to catch you. So when you shove these things in his ears and you're running off and he realizes he's got that great music playing and he's just going to stop with that dumbfounded look on his face, and he's going to start bopping his head up and down to the hey, music because he's listening to the Raycon. Hey, you know, I'm joking about the death of uh, the village, which is a real thing, and the expansion of NYU, which is also a real thing. If Hook is from St. Mark's Place now, is he just hanging out with college kids all the time? Well, that way he can cheat on his homework. Huh. Ah, but the Raycons, folks, back to them, and it's easier when, you, when you're holding somebody down with your left hand and to stick these things in their ears because they have the optimized gel tips. So they fit comfortably in your ears. So you don't really need to elbow it into the side of the guy's head. Just shove it in there with your thumb and it'll go pop and it'll stay there whether you're, you know, running away or whether you're chasing somebody or whether you're playing basketball or engaging in... Playing basketball, there's a great suggestion. Well, there you go. It, says, it even says some of that here. And, and, and Or if you're having conjugal relations with your significant other, they won't fall out of your head. So maybe put some dirty audio on, and that way it'll, it'll help that situation Maybe out. you're someone who's trying to get to work and you want to distract yourself from the crime in the subway. Well, don't distract yourself from that, because then you might be a victim of the crime in the subway. But that's why they've got the awareness mode. You can be listening to, for example, the police, and then pop the awareness mode button and know whether you need to call the police. See how that works? That, that was very good. That was very yeah, good. Yeah, thank you very much. And A message also, in the bottle to you. Yes, or where well, you might be getting hit over the head with a bottle. That's <laughs> why they've got the earbud tap function. So you tap that earbud, That's it'll turn why. it off so you can duck that bottle. That's not why they have that. Well, these things happen on the subway. And eight hours of playtime, you can ride from one end of the subway to the other. 
32 hours of battery life, and right now the best thing is save money. You may use it to bail yourself out after you've finished being arrested for tackling the guy in the East Greenwich Village to no. fucking stick these things in his ear. Again, let's not tackle anyone even if it is in a um, improperly pronounced area of New York. But you're giving them free earbuds, so doesn't that make it even? No, it doesn't make it even. Don't tackle anyone. Enjoy your earbuds and enjoy your day singing All and right, dancing just, in the streets listening go, to Raycon. Uh, that's the thing. Go out on the sidewalk and start singing and dancing and, and wearing a short skirt. And if you're a man, even better, because then people will look. And while they're looking, <laughs> your accomplice can come up behind no, you no, again. and just stick the goddamn no. earbuds in their ears without hitting them or tackling them. No. And then they won't know what. All of a sudden, their ears will be filled with the sound of music. My ears are suddenly filled with the sound of music. Courtesy of these Raycon wireless earbuds that somebody just stuck in my ears and ran off. What a lucky day. There will be no ear insertion that is not done by yourself. And let's hey, also... that's called aural sex. Well, that's not what that's called. That is exactly not what that's called. But what it is... A-U-R-A-L. What it is called is Raycon. And what Raycon is is something you can buy for yourself or as a gift for someone that you hand them and they place in their ear at their own time and... Uh, place of and choosing. choosing. That's place right. of choosing. And you can save money too now. If you go to buyraycon.com, that's B U Y R A Y C O N, buyraycon.com slash J C E, you're going to get 20% off your Raycon order and free shipping. So with the order one, or actually, if you need to order two earbuds because unless. Well, like certain members of the Feather, Featherbottom family, you only have one ear. But if you got two ears, order two of the earbuds. But you could order two sets, which would be four, or three sets, which would be six, and on and on. And if you want to get a, a, a bunch of sets in order to go out and stick them in people's ears to make the world a happier place, then you're going to get 20% off and free shipping on the whole shit and mess. Buyraycon.com slash JCE. That's right. Leave people alone and enjoy music or podcasts or whatever it may be with Raycon. What's that promo code, Jim? What do you mean to leave people alone? Now, see, that's why the world is such a lonely place. Leave people. You, who are you to question the idea of leaving people alone? Well, I've, I leave them alone and they leave me alone. See? Leave people alone. But sometimes people need to, to be not left alone. They don't want to be alone in this cold, cruel world. Well, you'll never be alone with the sound of whatever you're listening to, on Raycon. What's that promo code, Jim? Yes, slash JCE, 20% off and free shipping. Just order one for each year. Well, again, this is uh, an open letter to Tony Khan today. Tony, you're going to need to save some money. Maybe you can use that code, save yourself on some Raycons, because he spent more money, Tony has. Because the 9 o'clock hour was coming up, and guess who... The billion-dollar princess herself, Mercedes Moan, came out to the Monet. ring. Monet. Why do you keep calling her Moan? Because that's the way it was spelled. I thought it was M-O-N-E-T. That would be the fancy French pronunciation of Monet, but it's M-O-N-E. Well, funny so enough. So it's Mercedes Moan. Funny enough, if you listen to the way Justin Roberts pronounced her name and the way I've heard people say that she said it's supposed to be pronounced, even though it's spelled with a little whatever the hell you call it, above the E. A drava over the E? It's spelled as... Or is that an umlau? I don't know what the hell it is, but it's Monet. But she pronounces Monet, it... Monet. But she pronounces it pony. Monet. As Monet? In, as in she couldn't just write Mercedes money, so it's Mercedes Monet, but it's supposed to be pronounced like money. Well, why, why can't she just be Mercedes money? Does somebody have that trademarked? She's the CEO. Of what, by the way? There ain't gonna be any fucking money here anyway. The only money has already been paid. That's when Tony signed the contract. They've got a CEO. They've got EVPs. Who do you think is gonna be the director of operations? The do? Who's gonna do the do? So how... It, it, tell me again. How is Mercedes not a heel gimmick? Fake jewelry over the top everywhere. The dancing and the strutting. She's so full of herself. She's the CEO. She's waving her 
fancy rings are up in the air awkwardly. Why would you like this person? How is this a baby face gimmick? Well, Why she, do people like her? She was a heel, and then people took to her. And I have a feeling she may wear here? Out, I have a feeling she may wear out her welcome quickly here in AEW because That's what I'm saying. She in another environment, in another universe, in another company. Okay, she was a heel, and then people started liking her. So now she's in a new place, and she just acting like a heel. But she's doing color commentary on the four way women's match to determine who's the number one. Cont- I don't know what the fuck. Willow Nightingale versus Anna J versus Poor Chris Statlander versus Blue Sky, and. The idea is for Mercedes to do color because, you know, she's got this blood feud with Willow Nightingale over this, what was it, a near-endering, career-ending injury that she suffered. That's That's what she told us last week. Cost her a title. And she's going to do color to try to get interest in, I guess, herself and this issue she's got with Willow and any potential future matchups. And I don't know what the fuck happened. I did. Did they, they gave her nothing to say. They didn't prepare her. She can't do it on her own. She uh, had a bad reaction to prescription medicine. Was she in a coma? There was no emotion. There was no energy. She can't talk. She said nothing. She exhibited no personality at one point uh, about Chris Statlander. I think she was trying to say, well, she's got the size and the strength. She said she has the strong. She's got the strength. (laughs) I'm not lying. Go back and listen to this fucking thing. I had to listen to it. (laughs) And they gave her the, the opportunity. The announcers are asking her, what about this issue with you and Willow and the history between you and Willow or whatever a couple times to give her the opportunity to say what happened, what the injury was, what she wants to do about it. She said nothing. And in an awkward fashion, it's her story and she can't tell it. It, uh, it, meanwhile, in the match, uh, you're right. Willow's got something. And if, if Mercedes moan got, $10 $10 million, then Statlander deserves the Rocks deal. But she's buried in this mess. And finally, Willow won. And then Julia Hart knocked Willow out with the championship belt and then stared at Mercedes and then got out of the ring and they all looked at each other. But what was... Did you listen to this color? Just tell me what you thought of this color commentary. No, she's te- she's, she's not good on the mic. And then why put her on a mic? I don't know why they did. Now you didn't even bring up Anna J. Anna J. looked good here. She was oh for heavens. They should put the belt on Anna J. <sighs> Not this belt, the world belt. I have her go over Samoa Joe. That'll you send just statement. you just want to take the belt off of Anna J. That what absolutely you not. You're a pervert. You're a dirty old pervert. I am just saying she's got a look. She's got skill. She makes funny faces. She can move. She's athletic. She takes stupid bumps when needed. She takes stupid bumps when not needed. <laughs> Anna Jay is uh, someone that has a bright future. <sighs> She's got to wear shades, probably to hide the black eyes she gets from working with these fucking potato farmers. But anyway, <laughs> so that was the, the, the bionic woman there that Tony paid a lot of money for. I don't know what the... Were you, you surpri- said were you surprised this was the 9 o'clock hour? Yes, because that's a... <sighs> That's a risk not only to put this match in the ring at the nine o'clock hour, but also if, yes, if she's a big star at a ratings draw, do people like her from what she has done outside of wrestling? Does she have a big fan base from, what was that, um, the Chandelier? What's the show she was on? The Mandalorian. The 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 Mandalorian. The Maledictorian. Maled... Mandalorian, what does she have a lot of fans from comic cons and other things that don't watch wrestling? And then I would understand why people might like her. I don't because know. Because I, I mean, don't Star understand Wars is pretty this. big. Star Wars is pretty big. They got their own dedicated fans. Okay, point being, 
she's going to wear out her welcome with the wrestling fans real quick with performances or lack thereof like this is what I'm saying. Keep her off the microphone, get her in the ring if that's where she's if she excels because she's diminishing herself by coming out there and saying nothing and getting nothing over. Well, see, that's, and, part, that's part of the problem, though. Week one, she did that promo. She really didn't say anything, but she had the hometown pop, the return pop, whatever it was, all into everything she did. Week two, again, she didn't really say anything. Reaction was not that of a hometown crowd. Not terrible, but not what it was, obviously. And then out here... And is, why won't they let the announcer say, well, isn't it true, uh, Mercedes, that... Willow broke your ankle and you were almost, I'd tell the story for her and let her say, yes, that's right. I mean, something, give me something here. Hey Jim, quick update. Uh, I just got an email from Russell ticks, the final count tickets distributed for dynamite 3,438 tickets. Well, wait a minute. I thought that there were 4,000 as of earlier, as of yesterday, there were. This people brought some back? I don't know what happened. What the f- <laughs> They brought the tickets back for refunds before the show? Well, you gotta... Uh, there's pictures here of the building. I'm gonna uh, let you see these, but anyway, I Well, I've, I've, seen a, I've seen a couple of things on Twitter. I'm more believing 3,000 and 4,000. But nevertheless, we continue on. The tag team tournament rolls on. Brian, remember when Matt Taven and Mike Bennett were revealed along with Roderick Strong as part of the masked henchmen of the evil devil who turned out to be Adam Cole, who the group that that drove MJF, the biggest star in the company, out of the company and lost the title for him to Samoa Joe? Then, of course, they're trying to have Wardlow beat Samoa Joe. So this makes no I don't know what the fuck's going on, but they were at the top of the mountain. And they're in the tag team tournament, Taven and Bennett. And their opponents are Trent and Pockets with Muffin Top Taylor in the corner because apparently he's injured and can't wrestle as opposed to when he's well and can't wrestle. So the Devil's Henchman, now apparently co-managed by Roderick Strong, the Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions, are in a tournament match with a preliminary guy and the company mascot, and guess who won? I, I don't know what's sadder. Taven and Bennett could have been a credible tag team and contributed to this roster or the fact that Chuck Taylor has a job with a wrestling promotion. When there, there are homeless people out there that could be trained with almost no effort to be better wrestlers and would look the part more than Muffin Top Taylor and yet he's getting paid to stand around the ring and have a skin condition. Um, oh, I know why. Because since they beat Taven and Bennett and the Buckaroos beat the other fucking guys, the next match is the Buckaroos versus the best friends. So fuck Tony Khan's money. We want to play with our friends. So we're going to have that match. Is, is this, a, are they trying to drain him dry? Wouldn't they at least want the company to be successful in part so they could keep getting this money forever? Shad's going to cut Tony off after five years or so. Between five and seven hundred million dollars, I think he's going to say something. It's just a drop in the bucket. <sighs> so then, oh, did you have any comments on that tournament contest? I did not. Okay. Kyle O'Reilly was in the back. Here's a kid with a fucking different style than everybody else that works his ass off and, you know, had something in NXT and had a little something when he was here, even though it was diminishing, and then he's off for so long. And now he comes back, he looks homeless, he says nothing, he sounds sad and listless, and it's like I went over to the fucking... Valvoline and got one of the guys out of the grease pit and said, can you give me your thoughts on your wrestling career? Uh, what? What have they done? And finally, for our main event of the evening, Swerve Strickland against our boy, Take-A-Shit. And honestly, 
I think Tony should have given a shit instead of taking a shit. He's younger. He's better. He's got more potential than Mr. Okada. And I'm sure he costs probably one twentieth of the amount in salary. Why can our boy Take not fit the Okada spot? Everything Take does is more impressive athletically than what we've seen from Okada. As I said, he's bigger, he's younger, he's better looking. What the fuck is going on? Wouldn't it? He ought to be pissed. He's like, what the fuck? What about me? Well, Okada, Osprey, a lot of guys have been brought in. Takeshita is someone they had there, young. Fans immediately noticed him. They turned him heel. He had kind of a heel persona that worked, other than Don Callis, who sucks. What have they done with him? He doesn't win matches. So he goes out there and he has great competitive matches that he never wins. If only he was in a better place. What do you think if Take is thinking about Ibushi? Remember Ibushi? He signed a, a big contract, a full-time contract to come here, what, three or four months ago, and then went over to Japan, had a match, and blew both his, his ankles out, and he's had multiple surgeries, and he will probably be out for the majority of the contract. So Tony literally signed this guy to open up a hospital for him to headline. And he got a ton of money. And here's Take. He's the guy here that's working, that's making less than all of them, and the only one with any kind of potential to get over. But anyway, the, uh, Swerve and Take was a modern-style match with neither guy really being a leader, but they do moves better than most guys, so that's what it was. It was the same stuff as we've been watching with different guys doing it, but executing it better and then my dvr froze because they can't manage their time and they're trying to artificially manipulate the rating numbers and i assume that swerve won in the end a good action-packed match that swerve won in the end and that's where tony khan got it in the end what could be the payroll on one of these telecasts alone and and we didn't even have to look at the plumber, and he's being paid millions. And for however much Twinkle Toes is getting, he's in the hospital also. Tony has more people. That's why I said I think Tony ought to get in the medical industry. He's got more people in the hospital than he does in the ring. But what can be the fucking payroll for, and much less the production expenses, much less the rent on these giant buildings it's what he wants to do, and he's got the money to do it. Me, I'd build a Gilded Age mansion. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Tony wants to go spend it traveling the world with the wrestlers that he loves. There's something, we there's something romantic about that, Jim. Remember we broke that down one time. If I had a billion dollars, how would you ever possibly spend it? After I gave $10 million to everybody that I gave a shit about and contributed a hundred million to the crippled kids. And I think, what was it? 50 million to needy animals and cover 50 million to cure cancer and pay the tax of 300 million or 400 million on a billion. You still got tens of billions of dollars left. What the fuck? Well, Jim, at <sighs> this point in my show, we are going to time travel to the future and talk about the ratings for this show, and then we will time travel back, I hope, unless there's a problem with the machine, and talk, and I hear a phone as well. There's well, all sorts of technology abound here <laughs> on the show, but let's time travel, do the ratings, and then we'll be back with more drive through All right, that didn't go exactly how I thought it would, but we are yeah, here. There, there, there was almost a note there, but it turned into a suicide note. Oh, come on, stop that. It wasn't that bad. And I, didn't, I was, wasn't paying attention. I was getting ready to land here with the ratings <laughs> after we talked and about AEW Dynamite. I, I got to say, by the way, we, we took the break. The ratings have come in to you. I have no knowledge of forethought of what's going to go on here or what these ratings are, so I want you to surprise me. AEW Dynamite, 
March 27, 2024, on TBS from 8 to 10.05 p.m., as reported by WrestleNomics, on average, 747,000 viewers. Oh, Jesus! This is the lowest overall rating since April 7, 2021, and this is the lowest in the key demo since June 24th, 2020. Oh, and okay, they had competition. We're in the basketball tournament, right? Where they play in games on Wednesday, but they have that tournament every year, don't they? They would have had it in 22, well, 23. Well, this may have been more about the NBA than the Final Four. The NBA oh, is the on. NBA is doing things too. And there's that all night gas station open down the street. How are you going to compete with that? Well, the NBA has some good angles. Ooh, so 747, which is not a jumbo of a number for those Boeing fans out there. And uh, before we get into the uh, quarters, are we going to have to come up with a formula where we figure out at this point with all these new multi-million dollar signings and everything, how many dollars per viewer that it cost Tony to, to do a television show for? Is it like, Closing it on six dollars a viewer. You know, I don't know how anyone could be surprised. The lineup was underwhelming, and and the people that they're bringing in to seemingly give big pushes to, they're just caught doing what everyone else is doing. Will Osprey didn't need a twenty minute match to start this show with Shibata, who for all intents and purposes, is an unknown factor to wrestling fans in America. If you were, if Osprey had been here for two years and been outstanding that whole time and a main event guy and everything, and then Shibata shows up and nobody knows who the fuck he is, but then he has a 20-minute match with this main event guy, then you've made Shibata. But you can't make Osprey and make Shibata at the same time. They're two different recipes. But... Speaking of the first event, where did we start on the road to where we finished? Well, quarter one, once again, these were reported by WrestleNomics. Quarter one, 8 to 8.15 p.m. Katsuyori, Katsuyori. Yeah, what? Hold on, I, I never say his what? first name. I never say his first name. Just Katsuyori. 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 I said Katsuyori. Katsuyori Shibata. Shipoopy, shipoopy, shipoopy. Versus Will Ospreay with picture-in-picture -picture ads. 939,000 viewers. Oh, boy, howdy. Methinks this might get interesting toward the latter stages of this if they started out at the same place that they normally do. Basically, 900-and-something to a million. Well, they started out lower than that. This is below the trend line. Well, I know, but they're usually 940, 950 to a million thereabouts at the start. This is on the lower end of that. Well, quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the continuation of Shibata versus Osprey, the Brian Danielson video, and the Young Bucks backstage promo, and then an ad break, 802,000 viewers. Ooh, I don't know if you should call that a continuation of the match or a prolonging of the match, but 137,000 people. So that was, again, they get a bunch of folks from the Big Bang and the people, then they see, oh, not this, and they go away. And we've been saying it the last few weeks. Mercedes hasn't helped with the numbers. Osprey hasn't boosted things much. The Bucks have lost audience which has caused Okada to lose audience. Jericho has. The women have. Jim Corder, 3, 830. The, the, the last time that a high-priced talent gained Tony significant amounts of viewers, it was uh, CM Punk. Well, quarter 3, 830 to 845 p.m., the Okada angle, which I guess is just him arriving at the uh, building in his car, yeah, he arrives, and, and the Bucks tell us that he's going to watch their match on the monitor. That was his involvement. And the Young Bucks versus Private Party with picture-in-picture -picture ads, 711,000 viewers. Oh! Oh! Another 
can't do math with numbers this big. Another 91,000 people said, so they have lost 228,000 viewers in 45 minutes. Well, it's a All new right. uh, it's a new record for AEW. We go to quarter four, eight forty five to nine p.m. The continuation of the Bucks versus the Private Party. Well, the Private Party. The Private versus they're, Private they're, Party. They're so private they didn't even invite an audience. That's what Gary Hart would call them if he was managing against yeah. them. The Private Party. They'd fight the Sting. And then we have Swerve Strickland and Kanosuke Takeshita's video, an ad break. Darby Allen and Tony Hawk's video and Chris Jericho propositioning Hook backstage. That's Se a good way to put it, since he's going to fuck him. 776,000 viewers. Oh, now wait a minute. We bounced back here. 65,000 people, and that was... What was that for again? I zoned out. That was for the end of the Bucks Private Party match, which was all of the previous segment. And then the Swerve and Takeshita video, the Darby and Tony Hawk video, an ad break, and Jericho and Hook backstage. So Swerve and Darby and Hook, I wonder how much they're getting paid as opposed to these other people that are losing the viewers. But anyway, go ahead. We go to quarter five, the big nine o'clock hour, nine to nine fifteen p.m. Willow Nightingale versus Chris Statlander versus the gorgeous Anna J versus Sky Blue with picture on picture ads. With the moaning of Monet on the uh, on the color. The post match with Julia Hart and Mercedes Monet. Also the Dustin Rhodes Butcher backstage confrontation. I forgot I kind of zoomed past that. Setting up a big match for uh Rampage, I think. Yeah. Maybe collision, who knows? 771,000 viewers. Oh. Uh, so they come to the top of the hour and send Mercedes out there to moan at people and it loses him 5,000 viewers. Well, oh, okie dokie. Well, we okie doke over to quarter six, 9.15 to 9.30 p.m. A Tony Storm promo video that was her and Ben Mankiewicz of uh, Turner Classic Movies. Yeah, he, boy, they must be paying him a lot of money to get him to I'm talking about the people at Turner Classic to to cross promote in this fashion where <laughs> she even said all right say my catchphrase chin up chin up tits out I'm not going to say that and watch the shoe and he said I don't even know what that means he He's, uh, he looked really pleased to be there didn't he yeah th it's just one of those forced cross-promotional deals like RoboCop, only he's the one that's offended rather than the wrestling folks. Well, that, an ad break, a Swerve Strickland video, Matt Taven and Mike Bennett versus Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta with picture-in-picture -picture ads, 672,000 viewers. Oh, my goodness gracious. That's not very pee-picking good. That's a 99... 99? Missed it by that much. 99,000 people tuned out the, the butt buddies or best friends or whatever the fuck they are. Well, Jim, we go from quarter six to what else? Quarter seven, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The continuation of the Undisputed Kingdom versus the Best Friends, as well as the post-match with the Young Bucks, Kyle O'Reilly's backstage promo, this week in a clean t-shirt, an ad break, an Adam Copeland video, and the entrances for the main event. 654,000 viewers. <sighs> okay. I'm not, no, no comment. Let's see where this thing slides in. Well, we slide into quarter eight, and uh, there's a five minute overrun, I remind you. 9.45 to 10 p.m., Swerve Strickland versus Kanosuke Takeshita with picture in picture ads. 658,000 viewers. Five minute overrun, including Samoa Joe backstage doing a promo. 724,000 viewers. <laughs> yeah, suddenly all those people appeared. Um, you get, 
you get uh, 50, let's see, 50, 60, 66,000 people that are tuning in to watch, you know, the, the fucking best of goddamn whatever the fuck, the next program. Hey, minus the first quarter and minus the overrun, 720,000. That's what I was going to say. They started out with 939 that was artificially inflated by the Big Bang. They do the five-minute overrun so they can catch those 60 or 75,000 people that are wanting to watch whatever the fuck is on following. And that helps them bring up two through eight that's in the middle that, again, there's your average, 720,000 of what actually occurs in the middle of the fucking program. And, oh. and if you want to take their number as legitimate that they started, 939,000 people, then by the time they got to the low point, which was quarter seven in this whole thing, they had lost 240, wait a minute, God damn it again, these large numbers. They had lost, what's 300 minus... 15, they'd lost 285,000 people. That is 30% or maybe 32 or 33% of what they started with. Because, no, what the fuck? It's just endless. The guy's doing the same shit over and over. It all looks the same. It's constant matches of people doing things that don't really seem to have any effect and then you see more of it with different people and all the stars are either hurt fired gone or in a, a bad mood and don't want to show up for work i don't know i don't know what to tell you no like i said no yeah. one should be surprised will osprey comes in you're thinking okay they're gonna pivot from him being a heel in a heel faction go with him as a top baby face they put him in a long competitive match he didn't need. It may have made some of the smart fans happy, but the same people raving about the matches are going to be the only people left at this point. And for anyone right. saying, oh, they still did good, they were, you know, see, they're here. They were number three on cable. They're hemorrhaging viewers every week. You can predict which wrestlers and which segments will do it more than others and almost always be right. It's not about the time as much as the people, very often. But we're still supposed to pretend like these are, they're better than they, what, what they could be, because they could be lower. But they used to be higher. When we used to do the average a few weeks ago, just a few weeks ago, it would be like in the 800s. Now we're here. And the TV's not getting better. And it's appealing to people it's not appealing to the big audience. It's appealing to the smallest of the small audience. And you need a new booker. And the booking's terrible. And the booking's a problem. Good matchmaker, if you like those matches, horrible booker. And the whole company's owned by the booker. So you're screwed. That's the <clears throat> frustration with AEW. And trust me, the wrestlers feel it too. The wrestlers feel it too. You know what Dennis Condry would say, don't you? I'm afraid, no. Screwed, blued, and tattooed, dicked by the dangle dong of destiny. He said this often. Yeah, often. Every time somebody got what was coming to him. Now, again, the NBA's on, and, uh, you know, the weather is getting nicer. Oh, for God's, they're doing something. Or something's happening every day of the year somewhere in the world. The point is, this is not as... It's continuing to go down instead of up. They spend millions of dollars to sign people and the ratings go down and the ticket sales go down. Have we forgotten that Edge is there now? I'm not convinced he was ever a big ticket mover, but that's another story. Well, but I mean, he was a big star on the other TV. He yes, had never he been involved yes, in anything at, uh, of a, uh, you know, a below a million people or whatever Tony's tweet was at one time. Uh, until he, uh, nobody came with him. If they did, they they turned around and went back because look at this show that Edge is on. We feel sorry for him. It's that. 
you've got to acknowledge that when the again the only signing the only thing that he's that Tony has done that moved every metric whether it was pay-per-view Although they do wonderful, they do the same audience on pay per view within forty or fifty thousand either way on every one because that's their dedicated audience, right? But the only one that moved the the ratings, the only one that moved ticket sales, the only one that really you could tell made a difference in their first whatever million dollar pay per view was Punk, because he was able to come out and do his shit and be him and avoid getting any of this other shit on him involved with these goofballs or interacting with amateurish talent on screen or whatever, but everybody else they've signed for however many million dollars or hundred thousand dollars or whatever from the WWE or from Japan or from Cucamonga, they've been doing Tony shit like everybody else does in the same way as everybody else does. And nobody gives a shit about that. And that's why it doesn't move any numbers. They go down because the stars do not bring this show up. This show brings the stars down to earth. I don't know why it's it's hard to figure out. Nobody is better off when they go there if they've been a star before than they were before they went there. And the only reason that the guys who weren't stars before are better off is because at least they're on fucking TV. But that may not be good because of the way that they're being fucking exposed in the most brutal sense of the word. They're being exposed. All their worst weaknesses are being exploited and their strengths are being hidden. So who is, who is this TV program getting over? No one in AEW is ever over more than they were the week before. Never. Mercedes Monet already, whatever bump she gave them, and she didn't really give them one in terms of the ratings, but does she already just not seem as special as she did a few weeks ago? She didn't really do anything yet. Will Ospreay, same thing. Takeshita, squandered. If you're someone who loves Omega and the Bucks, have they been used well? Has anyone been used with Hobbs? How many restarts has there been for Hobbs? How many restarts for Wardlow? Who knows what's going to happen when MJF comes back? Because the company's in much worse shape today than it was when he got hurt. Moxley. Is Moxley even what he was in 2020 right now? And for the people that mark out for the Brian Danielson stuff, the bigger audience doesn't. And that's the problem. And, you know, at a certain point... And Danielson's retiring anyway. At a certain point, TNA could have thrown any amount of money at anyone. They weren't going to get past certain barriers that they kind of set for themselves once they didn't make it past certain points previously. It's starting to feel like AEW is hitting that point. That there is no game changer because you know what the game is no matter who's there. Raw feels fresh. Raw has a lot of older guys doing promos yelling at each other. <laughs> and it feels like the young, fresh show, AEW, the crowd is dead. They'll react at times, and for near falls, they sit there silent. And they get smaller. They've had a few big shows lately, and give them credit for that. But no one's over. They need top guys, and they can't. They. Tony can't establish anyone. Tony is not good at booking. And instead of certain people who Tony listens to, who know he's not good at booking, coming out and saying, Tony shouldn't be booking. They try to make excuses or give advice or, well, no, Tony should, you know, you have to do things like this. No, you shouldn't book. You shouldn't book. Even if you think fans can book, Tony's had a five-year run. Look at how things are now. He shouldn't be doing this. And anyone who doesn't come out and say that isn't doing him any favors. You're pretending. You're just making him happy by pretending. And it's sad. Oh, 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 yes. Because AEW I'm sucks the, right now. I'm the great pretender. Here's another song for you, Tony. Every year is getting shorter, never seem to find the time. Plans that either come to naught or half a page of scribbled lines. You need to turn over the book to someone before time runs out. Someone who is not a New Japan fan 
they get appreciated. But someone who understands how to do angle-driven, exciting wrestling, not wrestling based around long matches where every guy does the exact same thing and every guy kicks out of the exact same thing and they trade the exact same chops back and forth. Something different, because this is getting stale quick. And, and also it, it helps that the other channel has star, superstars, celebrities in every position. Their announcers are fucking stars in their own goddamn environment. Uh, the, the, they've got movie stars. They've got fucking UFC stars. They've got wrestling stars. They got all the stars. As Barnett would say, look at all my beautiful stars. And then over here, you got a bunch of people who the fans are looking at like the average fan would look in. Remember when the Jericho NBA crossover on Twitter happened? They were surprised that Jericho was still wrestling. And look at him. He's in the fucking minor league now. That's it's it's starting to get that fucking sniff to it anyway. It certainly is. But you know what? Uh. Speaking of Tony Khan and sniffing, and well, actually, they have nothing to do with each other. But <laughs> Jim, I think it's now time that we travel back from where we came. Yes. In the past, we are leaving the future. Let me get the machine. Let's, warmed up. let's take a snort of that time travel music. Jim, we have returned. <laughs> From where we began, <laughs> wherever that may be, and we have talked about AEW, we have some other stuff to talk about, probably won't go too long today, we have more stuff we'll be talking about on the experience. Good, we're you know just, it. we're all scrambled here, we're scrambled, we're, we're encrypted here in time, we don't know where we're at. That's right, we don't know where we're at, and we also don't know how we'll see what we want to see, because we are indeed time traveling like the Sherman and Peabody of wrestling. I'll let you figure out who's who, ladies and gentlemen. But Jim, wherever you may be, whatever continent you may be on or in the sky. You're grasping, you're trying to... I don't know how it. I'm going to get there. You need to access content. You don't know how you're going to get your favorite content. You need to be able to get past whatever barriers are up there. Express VPN! Well, they're back, our friends at ExpressVPN. You've been waiting on them, folks, because we've had so much wonderful feedback from the, the quality service that the people at ExpressVPN provide. And, Brian, now not only do you need ExpressVPN so you can, you can access this programming from around the world, and we found out some people in, in England or the UK or over in Bolivia or Guatemala, they can see shows that we can't see, so we have ExpressVPN to make these people think that we're in Guatemala or Bolivia or the Isle of Malta so that we can watch these programs. You wouldn't believe the cooking shows on the Isle of Malta. But nevertheless, Brian, there's another problem here. Some things have been going on that you don't know. Did you realize that every time that you connect to an unencrypted network, and so let's say you're out at a hotel or an airport, or a cafe. Actually, if you're a person who a frequents cafe. cafes, you deserve to have something bad happen to you. Which, what does that mean? But now, well, that's only for those hoity-toity, little st nose-stuck-up-in-the-air snobs. You have a little neighborhood cafe. You want to go get some coffee and something to eat? Why? What's the problem? Oh, a little cafe out there on the French Riviera with all the fucking millionaires and billionaires. Fuck them all. But anyway. That could be your talk show, Mercedes Monet's Cafe. The, the Monet Cafe. The Monet Cafe. And I understand they overcharge for everything on the menu. <laughs> but nevertheless, let's say you're at a hotel in an airport. That's where normal people go. But did you know that if you take one of these new, the, the ding-dang, ding-dongs, they've got these doodads, what do they call them, laptops? Yeah, they can, you get on the Wi-Fi networks in the hotels and airports with your laptop or your device or whatever. Did you know, Brian, were you aware that any hacker on the same network can gain access to your personal data, the passwords, the finance? They just swoop right into your computer when you connect to this network. It's like opening up a main artery to an evil, vicious poison in your bloodstream. What do they and do? They get they, in. Do they just hang out by the gate at the airport? Do they hang out in the lobby of the hotel and just wait for people? Well, here's the thing. Apparently, from what I'm 
being told by the folks at ExpressVPN there is a ring of 12-year-old children that are operating out of a discount hardware store, and they're going around all these places and stealing all your personal information whenever no. you log on to one of these not true. goddamn networks. Well, of course, it is true. It's not true, and you did not hear that from ExpressVPN. Let's right make sure on, we say that right now. It is true. It says right here. Just some, it doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack someone. Just some cheap hardware is needed. A smart 12 year old could do it. So, these 12 year old kids operating out of these discount hardware stores. No, there's no hardware store. It says just cheap hardware is needed. It says they can do it, not that they will do it, not that they would do it, not that it will they're, happen. They're, they're getting a, a, a cheap hammer and a saw and an auger and a, a level. Cheap hammer? And, and well, it says cheap hardware, and they're going out, these 12 year old kids, and they are hacking into people's laptops when they turn their back at the network, at, at the hotel, and the airport, and the cafe. At the network. Well, uh, they're on the network. And you know, hackers can make up to $1,000 a person selling personal information Whoa. on the dark web. As a matter of fact, some people I'd like some information on, I'd pay even more than that. But that's what that's what you're risking, not only, and by the way, remember, folks, it is the Express VPN people that brought light to the problem, the growing problem that we've been spreading awareness about, that the big major internet providers have people secreted in the walls of your home no. listening to whatever you're doing. We've established this is not true. Yeah, this is well, a figment no, of your imagination. This is not true. No, we've talked about it. That's why two people show up and only one leaves every time the cable company comes to your house. But now we know that not only are there people in the walls of your home, but when you go out in public, there's some 12-year-old brat that's too smart for his own good no. with a goddamn cheap fucking hacksaw ready to fucking steal all your information and sell it to the Russians. It's easy enough to hack you that a 12-year-old could do it, not that there's a gang of 12-year-olds operating and selling information on the dark web. Well, not that we know of. That's because they're smart and it's dark. But I'll tell you, right now... ExpressVPN is going to stop all this because do you know that right here it says it would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years, one billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption fucking thing they got going on? That may, if, if it would take a supercomputer a billion years, a 12-year-old with a goddamn chisel ain't going to cut it, right? So all you do is fire up the app and click one button and you are protected. And as long as you pay these people at ExpressVPN regularly and on time and in, in good currency that's spendable, the then normal. you're protected. But now the, the day that you let the fucking bill lapse now, some of your shit's going to blow up. But that's a No, no, pay. no. Nothing is going to blow up, so let's not say that or joke about that. Well, get blow up in the technical sense that, you know, it's just going to be all... How, how it's going to be work? all scrambled. Well, when you turn it on, that's the technical sense of blow up. Yeah, it it just it just it's all scrambled. You can't tell what's going on because they got your they got the, your shit in their hands. They can send it to fucking Nigeria or goddamn the the wilds of Australia. You never know where your shit's going around the world with ExpressVPN. They keep people on their toes. If somebody's I chasing you, I never know where gonna, your shit is going. I never know. Well, they're they're going to rack up a hell of a fucking trans bill if somebody's chasing you because ExpressVPN is relocating you all around the globe, so they can't pin you down. Of course, it is hectic. You need to pack light. But anyway, secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash JCE. That's expressvpn.com slash JCE. You get an extra three months free. So that's three more months you don't have to worry about some of these fucking delinquent children hitting you over the head and stealing your personal information, and you don't have to worry about the people in your walls, and 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 nobody's going to know where you, even your immediate family will not be able to find you with ExpressVPN. Nobody's going to be able to track you down. It's like you vanish. All right, well, I don't think it's like that at all, but once again, access your favorite programs, whatever. The they may be on wherever that may be with ExpressVPN. And protect yourself. What's that promo code, Jim? Protect yourself. J-C-E. Protect yourself.
Protect yourself. All right. Well, that was embarrassing. Jim, let's well, move I'm, on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you feel embarrassed, Brian. You didn't do that bad. I, I got you through yeah, it. Okay. Well, let's, uh, before you, uh, you sound like one of the contortions there, but let's go now, Jim, to another show that we watched this past week, one that I think some people were intrigued by in advance, Dark Side of the Rings episode on Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Well, yes, and, and we did want the, the one pressing question that I thought we might get an answer to. Why is everybody mad at Missy Beefcake? We didn't get the answer. We got teased at the end. It took Right at the end of the program, about the last 10 minutes, were people weighing in on was she or was she not the reason why that Hulk and Beef are no longer friends? Boy, how scared is everyone from Tampa of upsetting Hulk Hogan? And boy, do you, we don't know. <laughs> we don't want to get involved in anything. <laughs> Good Lord, it's it's like he's, you know, standing behind him with a fucking hammer. Um, they don't want to be cut out like Beefcake was. Cut out of what? The world what? of Hulkamania, just being around Terry's spirit. Who would give a shit? Right? But anyway, nevertheless, um, I didn't really even take notes on this episode because there wasn't any new ground broken as far as Brutus Beefcake's career or whatever. Um, and to be honest, it it shed the light. Or remember, I've, I the the clip of Memphis Television with them being interviewed, Terry and Eddie Boulder, the Boulder brothers, was the that was the first the day that the Freebirds made their first appearance playing the Freebird music on Memphis TV. That was the TV that uh, took place the weekend that the Wrestling Fans International Association convention was in town in 1979. So I was there in the studio and have some uh, cool pictures of Lance interviewing the, the guys and et cetera. But that was their first, as, as everybody knows, kind of their first territory. And they explained in the Dark Side episode that when Hogan started training to wrestle, that Ed Leslie was his friend as well. I ought to do this too. And they were working on being bodybuilders and just kind of got in the business. And that was the thing I remember seeing, seeing Hulk and his brother, Eddie, at that period of time where they were both rookies. Hogan was green, but you could tell he had, he had something he could talk a little bit and he would the size of him and just the physique. You, you, you could get something out of that with Eddie at that time. You remember the ridiculous long blonde hair, just even then the people, the fans saw him as the little brother that probably wasn't any good. Right. <laughs> and I'm not trying to knock you say everybody has to start somewhere, but I've told the story before Jarrett tried to, give him a push and put him in an angle in an, a main event with uh, Ron Bass and Pete Austin, a guy named Pete Austin from Boston, who only wrestled for a couple of years in the 70s, but he was here at that point. And they put them in the main event on a card that also featured Lawler and Dundee against the Freebirds. And that was the night that the Fargos worked with Jackie and Roughhouse were against Wayne Ferris, Larry Latham, and Danny Davis in a three-on-two handicap. And But to try to make the Boulder brothers important, you know, they put them on last. They couldn't follow Lawler and Dundee and the Freebirds and the fucking Fargos and a tear-the-house-down thing. And I never saw it in Memphis before, but people were actually leaving during the main event. Usually I was Lawler. That's what the the people that were there came to see, and the people that didn't pay snuck in to see the main event, right? They're leaving during the main event. It was brutal. And, I get, you know, as they mentioned in the show, Hulk went on and picked things up because of his size and his look and the way that he could talk. You know, people instantly started using him. Whereas Ed, Eddie Boulder became Dizzy Hogan. Uh, what were some of the other names? God, I've forgotten about him. Now, he went to Portland. Dizzy he went Ed to Hogan. Places. Uh, yeah, Ed, Ed, Dizzy, Dizzy Ed Leslie or Dizzy Ed Hogan. I like the he, reason, too. Why would you name that? Terry Funk just said I look like I'm Dizzy. Yeah. So it never really worked because he they they kind of said in the episode, some guys have, you know, 
are great in-ring performers, and some guys get the right gimmick. Well, he never had the right gimmick until they did Brutus Beefcake. And unfortunately, you go back and look now, and that was such an iconic gimmick and name and everything they did with him that people say, oh, he was a big star in wrestling. Literally, that was the only... The WWF was the only place that Beefcake ever worked where he was featured on top in any money-making, you know, prominent position. And when he left the WWF, he couldn't take it with him because Vince had it trademarked, and that's where Bischoff didn't mind. Everybody likes Beefcake, right? They're not knocking him as a person, but Bischoff said, I just took him working there to be the, the Hogan tax. He knew that he had to give beefcake a job but he couldn't be beefcake so they had him do umpty more different gimmicks the disciple and the the uh, uh booty man and the fucking uh, whatever and they went through some of those i can't remember those either nobody can and it's kind of it's sad that he wasn't the greatest worker but he had personality and he was over the top and he'd do whatever but that's a case of when you've got a gimmick like that that gets over, but the company owns it, you can't take it anywhere else, and you're fucked. And by that point, at the end of the WCW run, you know, he did some indies after a while, but he had, as they mentioned, he moved to Boston to be around his family and his kids when his ex split up. And, you know, he, except for indies in the early 2000s, you know, he was, that was kind of it. So really his window there was what, 12, 13 years, but only, well, he was in the business, he was in the business 20 years, but he was only Brutus Beefcake for like what, four or five? From 84 until 93. Okay, so for nine years he was, but, and he wasn't there consistently, he was in and out. The last couple of years, because. Yeah, the, the last injury. couple. After 1990, yeah. Yeah. But it, uh, but anyway, then, I mean, it, it, it's in there entertaining in a way, but this is another episode where the guy may have been his own worst enemy. It, you know, he's got to move to fucking Boston and get a job as a toll booth worker, but, well, how does a toll booth worker afford cocaine to have the cocaine in the fucking booth to shut the rapid transit system down when they find it and think it's anthrax. It's not just rich people buying cocaine. Well, here's the thing. If I've been a major television superstar and then I'm reduced, redu reduced, reduced to working as a toll booth collector, but I'm still spending money on cocaine, shoot me in the fucking head for one thing. God damn, we got to have some fucking perspective and level of importance to these things but also the story was disputed because he said it was a bc headache powder and but greg valentine his longtime tag team partner was quoted as saying well you want me to be honest with you it was cocaine if it was a bc headache powder wouldn't it be in a bc headache powder wrapper why would you take the fucking headache powder and put it into a little Plastic baggy, Brian. Would you do that? Greg Valentine's the guy sitting at the end of the bar that just has life figured out. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he's never upset about anything. He's just, oh, I'll tell you what it was. Uh, but, uh, and then, as I mentioned, my other, you know, uh, takeaway from it was they, over the last 10 minutes, they examined, well, what's happened? Because Missy and... And Brutus seemed to be happy as two pigs in poop, and I'm happy for him and glad for him. But a lot of other people didn't seem to have anything good to say about her, but nobody would explain why. And that's apparently Hogan is quoted as saying, well, I had to cut Beefcake off. It has to do with the woman that he married. But she don't know, she says, and nobody else is wanting to say anything. And and they were hanging out the night before, and there were no problems, and they showed up the next day at his house, and all of a sudden there were problems. He was cold, like they flipped a switch. So they left us with a cliffhanger. We're never going to know, but apparently... And is that they brought Hogan in when Beefcake got his face caved in, which, by the way, a classic fucking episode title, Saving Face, the Brutus Beefcake story. 
But they called Hogan into the hospital. They were. It's like a New York Post headline from the yeah. 80s. <laughs> they were friends all that time, but now the, Hogan won't speak to him. What the fuck is, you know. But anyway, we didn't get that question answered, but it was a, a look into the life of Brutus Beefcake, who, by the way, again, here, another one of these guys, the bodybuilders. And now he's 350 pounds. Looks like they filled him with sand. I hope it's not due to injuries sustained in the ring, but at the same time, it seems like if you had injuries sustained in the ring that were slowing you down in your 60s, you might want to lose some weight. I find it worked for me. I'm never going to let any of these motherfuckers, these goddamn bench-pressing, bodybuilding son of a bitches, forget that I look better than all of them now. The worm finally turned. You know, the way you keep going on about her on the show, I was expecting some kind of Marty Funk kind of situation. Missy Beefcake, beyond, you know, either some plastic surgery or tanning issues, I, I really couldn't even figure it out. She's from Florida, been in the sun a lot. Well, she's from Boston, I think. But she seems rather pleasant. Well, she did, and that's why, we, but remember, it was like she, there was a big feud on the social media with her and Greg Valentine here not long ago, and... She was saying what a miserable, no good son of bitch Greg Valentine was. And Greg Valentine's, well, I fucking hate that bitch. <laughs> she said that, and Greg Valentine, when reached for comments, said, eh, fuck yeah, you. Yeah, fuck you. Go fuck yourself. So, uh, so we, we never got to the, to the bottom of all of that. But, um, but they seem happy as two, two kids, two, two star crossed lovers on prom night. I feel like this was a disappointing episode. I thought last week's episode was really good. This week's. I don't know. It could have been better. I don't know what exactly it was missing. It bounced around a lot historically. And if you, if you weren't, uh, besides the face accident and surgery, which was, you know, everybody was, Oh God, the doctor describing how he put his face back together and they peeled his skin off and all that stuff. If you weren't concerned that this longtime friendship between Hulk Hogan and his buddy went awry, or a fan of Brutus Beefcake from the period of 1985 to 1993, it was a little dry. A little dry. Yeah, and by the end of it, it almost felt like the producers were working with him on this, like, video plea for Hulk Hogan to talk to him again. Yeah, no, he was said it like, said it like a piece on a telethon. <laughs> Folks, only you can get these two back together again. If you'll just send now, we'll send you this commemorative pin. But uh, but Dark Side of the Ring is still on Vice TV on Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. And next week is, God damn it, I forgot. What Harley is, Race. Handsome Harley, Harley Race. Race. Handsome Harley. And, and uh, there's got to be some great footage on that. We talked about, they, they found some incredible footage with the family. Well, the most important thing is the preview video they did to show next week's episode. There was a clip of a man, a white man seemingly with a perm, walking away from a ring on fire. <laughs> so either they addressed Hulk Hogan's story in comical fashion or, well, let's yes. see what happens. Let's see. What well, happens. I know that I will be on that program, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to tune in, to, it's a safe shot. I'll be on next week. But I've mentioned that story in a, uh, in a, in a tongue-in-cheek manner, and potentially that may be the manner in which that's applied. But... Harley's going to set some things on fire next week. All right, Jim. Well, that was Dark Side of the Ring. And with that, we're going to wrap up the drive through We're going to do it rather quickly. We are going to be returning very quickly with more of the more. There's just more. More of the quickly. More. And quickly WrestleMania. More. And Mania is coming up. And huh. AEW is going to have a dynasty. Uh, at least hey, could, could I do any kind of... I got to get on the phone and call... Stephen P. New at 87750Steve, by the way, because I, in 1982, had Cornette's Dynasty of Champions. And I'm saying that Tony Khan is stealing my intellectual property for this Dynasty pay per view. And I'm calling Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 87750Steve, oh, to on. press charges for copyright infringement, impingement, and violation aforesaid wherewithal and wherein. I'm taking Tony Khan's side on this one. How dare you? You have no claim to dynasty because you're the dynasty of champions. 
It well, it's either me, it's either me or Joan Collins, and she's dead, right? No, she's alive. We've established that she is, is she alive. alive. I thought she was dead. That was her sister. And now you have to wonder that when Tony tweeted out the Joan Collins thing, was it because he was like, "I'm going to do a pay per view called Dynasty"? Let me see if there was any Dynasty gifts available. We don't know, and we also don't know how to wrap up this show. Anything? It's else your we'll show. Say? Anything else you want to say? I didn't want to say half the stuff I've already said. All right. Well, I don't want to say any more either. You can hear us on the experience wherever you find your favorite podcast. YouTube, just look for Jim Cornette. Patreon.com slash Cornette, the archive, $5 a month. We're both on Twitter. If you don't know how to find this by now. We we trend regularly. Just click on something. You'll get there eventually. We'll tell you. We'll remind you again next week. But uh, Cornette's Collectibles at JimCornette.com. The law office of Stephen P. New. Newlawoffice.com. 50 Steve. Uh, with 877, of course. 877 steve Put the 877 in front of the 50 Steve or you're going to have troubles. To get to 50 Steve. You'll, you'll right. think that ExpressVPN's got a hold of you. But until the Jim Cornette experience or any other crazy wrestling drama that happens that causes us to come back before then, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!